Hello, 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 folks. How we doing? Hope everybody had a good day. For uh, folks in the U.S., I hope uh, everybody's enjoying their Labor Day weekend so far. I certainly have been. What? Miguel Vargas Dev, thank you so much. Wow. Thank you so much for the sub, Miguel. Uh, really appreciate it. I hope you're having an awesome weekend. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Hey, Hazel. Hey, Chris and Mel. <laughs> hi, Hertz. Hi, Poppy. Hey, Mama Ham. Hey, Goober. Hey, inadequate. <laughs> All right, welcome, welcome, folks. Let me go ahead and get my screen sorted out here. Hey, I'm gonna be gotten. All right. Hello, everyone. How are we doing? Hope everyone is having a good day and a good uh, Labor Day weekend so far for our friends in the U.S. Um, hey, Dev. <laughs> no worries. Yeah, definitely catch the VOD. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm having a good Labor Day weekend. And I hope you all are, too. Uh, did anybody um, catch a $3 movie yesterday for uh, a bunch of theaters across the U.S. yesterday? We're doing uh, movies in theaters for $3. So I certainly uh, took advantage of that. <laughs> oh, your mom did Nova. Got tick tried to get tickets too late. Oh no. <laughs> hey, Zena. Yeah, so um I actually did. Yeah, I uh I went and saw so I saw that one of my local theaters was a showing a uh, Top Gun Maverick in IMAX and I saw it before in regular regular screen uh in the theater but i thought ooh, in imax i bet that'd be really good so i went and saw it really late last night like the last showing at like 10 p.m um so yeah that was interesting uh but no it was really good really fun in imax i did wear and to be to be fair i did wear a um an n95 uh like full n95 mask the entire time because yes COVID is definitely still a concern Absolutely. Yeah, every time I go to the theater, I wear a, a full, like, form-fitting uh, N95. The movie was so visually pleasing. Yeah, it's just so fun, right? It's not particularly deep or anything. It's just, you know, it's just a lot of fun. And so that's, those, those kinds of movies are really nice now and again. Movies that are good, but also not, don't take a lot of thought. <laughs> Ah, uh, Goofer. <laughs> Thank you so much for the resub, Goofer. 
Really appreciate it. Thank you. And again, thank you, uh, Miguel Vargas. Um, they subbed right at the start of the stream when a lot of folks, before a lot of folks got here. So um, really appreciate it. Thank you so much to both of you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, I imagine that, uh, you know, we might have a lighter crowd this weekend because folks are doing fun things for Labor Day or maybe traveling somewhere, which is awesome, or uh, working on their group projects, which is also awesome. So uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, and I kind of wanted to have just a fun project this weekend, right? Like not nothing earth shattering or particularly, you know, particularly wild and crazy, but I did kind of feel the, the need for speed and the need to uh, uh, build, uh, kind of just do a project build, which, which I haven't done in a while. Um, sometimes it's just fun to, you know, come up with a, you know, to find a cool project and try to build it out and, and do and break stuff with it and all that. So that's what we're going to kind of do today. <laughs> My fun thing for Labor Day is coding all day. Well, that's, I guess, you know, that's what I've been doing so far. So <laughs> Only going to shatter the food industry. No, so uh, yeah, I'll go ahead and show you all what we're going to do today. Um, all right. Let me get it pulled up, get it set up. All right. Gameplay window. God, we're all nerds. Yes, we are. It's a wonderful thing to be, isn't it? Hey, Nerubian. Welcome. Uh, Iraq says, I don't want to go off topic, but if I'm in the middle of 100 devs and don't have any projects, should I still apply for an apprenticeship that starts in January? Well, I mean, if, if the application window is going to close here before you're able to get those projects on your resume, I mean, what's the harm in applying, right? As long as you're, um, you know, practicing your banking and you're reasonably, you know, attuned to interview questions, you can at least give it a shot. I mean, in my opinion, there's no harm in trying, right? Okay, so um, let's take a look at this. This is the this is the app, uh, and so basically what you do is you just log in, and I have a you know pre-filled login here. Uh, click login, and then you can also sign up if you want to create a new account. Uh, log in, and what this gives you is it, it's visually it's very simple. Um, what it gives you is a listing of um, various restaurants that you can add. So you, add, you submit the data yourself, you add them, um, and then you also add the data about their menus. And the reason why I like this is because I don't know, you know about everybody, but for me anyway, uh, I don't go out to eat very often. And so when I do, I can never remember, like I know my favorite places, but I can never remember like what's on the menu. And then every single time I have to Google the freaking menu and like find it and like sometimes if the website's really crappy i have to like dig through multiple screens just to find the menu it's like i just want to see what food you have before i get there um and so what this the, what this will do is it'll let me add you know the menus for the restaurants that i like um so i can just kind of look through them and decide what i want on the times when i do decide to go get something to eat um so this is going to be really useful for me i'm really excited about it um there's a bunch of improvements like this is this this is what i would call the minimum viable product um, I do really want, to, really want to make this better um, and have more features and buttons and stuff. And so I really think that this will be something that I will actually use like on my phone or on my desktop. <laughs> oh, Dev says, this is so similar to one of my 100, uh, 100 uh, hours project ideas. Oh, that's rad. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, yeah, and so where did I come up with this idea? So that's a great question, Homeless. So I want to give proper credit. This is based on a tutorial that I found on YouTube by a very small YouTuber. Um, and so I do want to give them some vis visibility. Um, their name is Coder Kai. Um, and I can link to their to the to the video that to the exact video that that this comes from. I will say that this my version is modified and is going to become much more modified as I go. Uh, I'm using some of their ideas as a starting point and then, you know, modifying it and making it my own, which is what you should do when you do a tutorial. Um, so here's the link to that video where they start and it's, it's a multi-part tutorial. So it's like three or four parts. I don't know. Um, and yeah, so that's that this is based on what they did. Um, and 
I am taking it and whenever you do a tutorial, you should, you know, build the build the, the tutorial and then modify it and do something with it and break things and add things and remove things. And so that's what I've been doing with this. Uh, and I plan on doing a lot more of that, um, you know, as I go. Yeah, like it is like Cobra Kai, exactly. That makes them really hard to search for on YouTube because YouTube just automatically corrects it to Cobra Kai, which is like, no, that's not the channel. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So homeless, I guess the answer to your question there would be, yes, it is. This code is on their YouTube channel and it's on my GitHub now, my modified version. And I'm going to keep, like I say, I'm going to keep modifying it. Um, and so, yeah, if you want to use it to make something else, like that's, that's the cool thing about, um, you know, tutorials and coding and stuff is that, you know, people are choosing to share this. And as long as you don't try to market it solely as your own, um, with no modifications from the original, as long as you're, you know, making it your own in some way and properly crediting your sources, um, then yeah, use it for whatever, build something cool with it. And then as long as you tag me on Twitter and maybe if the, I don't know if this, if that YouTuber has a Twitter, if you can tag them as well. Um, that would be great. rat a tat -a <laughs> uh, Which program do I use? Um, I mean, I, I, I do my coding in VS Code. Um, are you talking about like which language? And in which case, it's mostly JavaScript with some EJS and then MongoDB is a backend. Yeah. Uh, what are we using for styling? Here we're using Bootstrap, um, which I'm not super super familiar with, which is why tutorials are great. <laughs> because I don't really know much about Bootstrap at all. Um, so, you know, but you, you don't have to know about it to, to use it, right? As long as you can plug, you know, put the Legos together. You don't, you don't really got to know what you're doing. As long as it works. Also, hi. Yes, hello. <laughs> Yeah, and there's so many options out there, right? You got Bootstrap, um, you know, you, you got well, like Tailwind and, and all these other options that we're just beginning to explore, right? And so the more we can kind of play around with these things, the more we'll figure out what we like and what we don't like. Bootstrap, I know, Bootstrap is like the OG, right? <laughs> it's, it works pretty well for this. Uh, and so another feature of this is that you can also do a very simple search. So, um, I'm going to search for, so this bottom restaurant down here is called Taco Rico. Um, I'm going to search for them. So I'm going to say taco and search. And then when I do that, I get this one result back. Um, and from there, um, I can go ahead and see their menu. Like click this link. It takes me right to their menu. Um, and, you know, same with all these other ones. I can also edit. So if I wanted to edit this one um, and, you know, change the name. Um, so I can say restaurant and then save that. There we go. Um, so no, another thing I want to add here is like listing the restaurant name and maybe some notes about them and stuff like that, but I haven't gotten there yet. <laughs> yeah. And like with any, you know, I feel like with any, um, tools, right? With any tools, the more it gets used, the more it's easier to, to spot and maybe certain types of sites have a certain look and stuff like that. But in the end, I guess, in my opinion, it doesn't really, as long as they're functional for me, like it's more about like the user experience. Is the user experience good? Is the site functional? And does it provide what the user is looking for? I would say if it meets those criteria, then it doesn't matter what tools you use to build it. As long as it's, you know, as long as it's functional, it has the right information um, and, you know, it, it's accessible, I guess, to, to, the, to the most number of users. What framework do I use? So um, this is built in, um, so JavaScript with um, EJS and uh, Bootstrap and uh, MongoDB on the back end. Yeah. Um, and so that's really most of the features. Um, oh, you can also add new menu. Um, so, you know, add the new menu, put the name, put the URL and put the menu URL. Um, and I guess I don't have a back button here. That'd be something to add. <laughs> Whoops, there's a little path that needs fixing. Uh, and then you can also log out, which, you know, obviously logs you out. Um, 
And then when you log back in, you can also create a new account, um, email and password, and then create the account. And then what's happening in MongoDB um, is, let me reload this, refresh. Menu tracker, um, you know, it's storing each of those users inside of MongoDB um, along with their session data and the menus. So very similar to the types of things we've seen before as far as these, um, you know, as far as these types of MVC um, CRUD apps, right? Um, having, you know, a single database with multiple collections, um, and the one thing that this does not do yet, so there's there's a couple major things that this app is missing. Um, let me go back to the login here, log back in. So the the main things that this app is missing so far, which are things I definitely want to add, um, are right now the individual items in the list in the list of restaurants um, are not tied to specific users, and I can tell that by looking at. Um, you know, the list of properties here in MongoDB. So there's no user ID property to tie individual like restaurants to individual users. So you can have users, but there's no association. So that's my going to be the next thing I'm going to add. We're not going to add it on stream today. Uh, I almost got there. Um, but then I, in the end, I had to roll back to a stable build. So, um, but that's definitely something I'm going to add. Um, the other thing that this app is missing is it does, um, you know, authentication. Um, it stores user data. It has session information and it, it hashes and salts passwords, but it's actually not using Passport. Um, it's kind of doing it on the fly, um, which you know is a viable thing to, that you can do, um, but it's not using Passport specifically right now. So I'm gonna also add in Passport. Again, that was one of those things I was almost able to implement and then in the end I had to roll back, um, but that's you know a few more hours and I'll probably have that in place as well. Um, so just FYI, as we go into this, those are the things you won't see, um, but those are the things that I will be adding. And so if you keep an eye on that GitHub repo, um, which I will share with you, um, this is the GitHub repo where this code is currently. If you keep an eye on this repo, um, I think you will see those things appear <laughs> over the next week or so. All right, let me catch up with chat here. Uh, Zena says, when working on a project of this scale, does it make sense to work out features and functionality and then style it up? I assume you mean like putting on like styling after the fact. Um, I mean, that's how I do it. Um, I, if I'm building something from scratch, I will always start with like, what features do I want and kind of just slap it out there, right? Like make sure that the routes are working and things are ticking um, and then start to style it once I have all the components in place and then, you know, start moving them around. Um, but you know, that's up to you. Everybody's different, right? Some folks start with some folks have like some folks, if they can visualize really well, they might have like the end layout in mind with all the features, like exactly where they want them. And so they might start with that and then, you know, build the back end that supports those features. I'm just not very good at visualizing. I can't see, I don't have a very good picture in my mind's eye of things. Um, and so I tend to start like, you know, building it iteratively and then, and then styling it afterwards. But not, not everybody thinks the same way, right? So I wouldn't say there's a right way to do it or a wrong way. Uh, Horizon says, do you post your content anywhere? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And Rascal2 shared my YouTube channel. Um, all of my content goes there. Um, at least the, the, the 100 devs related content goes there. Um, so yeah, you can find it there. Also the VODs, all my VODs are on my Twitch for 60 days. Um, but yeah, then they're there on YouTube in, in perpetuity. So I don't filter anything out, anything 100 devs related out from my uh, YouTube channel. So you should be able to find everything there. <laughs> Tay Mister, thank you so much for the sub. Wow, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. You have bought a split keyboard to test out and see if it helps your forums. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, as your guys are, you know, getting into this journey, into this dev journey and, and start really spending a lot of your time at the computer and coding and developing, it is really important to think about ergonomics. Um, I mean, I made the mistake of not doing that. Um, and I actually almost like crippled my hand. Um, I still today, I don't know if it was carpal tunnel or, or what, but I really injured my hand just from the repetitive motions of using the mouse. It wasn't even anything crazy. It was just using a like 
a regular mouse just like this um I really injured my hand my thumb hurt my my middle finger hurt so much um and it took me for I was wearing a brace for the longest time and eventually for work I actually got I had my employer buy me a vertical mouse so like a one that where you hold your your wrist like this um and that immediately that that fixed everything so you got to think about ergonomics and if you can get your employer to buy it <laughs> Hazel says, I have F aphantasia, so no visual imagination for me. Yeah, I don't think I have aphantasia, but I don't have very much of a mind's eye. It's very limited, and I don't, I just can't visualize, like, full things very well. <laughs> Tailwind, yeah. Yeah, a lot of folks I know on the Discord have been experimenting with Tailwind. <laughs> love tailwind yeah okay well let's see if we can get into this a little bit so what we're gonna do is um we're gonna what 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 i find works really well is if i can not do things completely from scratch if i can find something that has most of the features that i want and then you know copy and paste and add and remove things um that really helps my development process go a lot faster. So what we're going to do is we're going to base our um, kind of what we're doing off of the off of Leon's um, MVC auth template. Um, we're going to we're going to kind of build a new you know we're going to build a new um, code base, but we're going to be copying and pasting at various points from Leon's template into our code. Um, so I say that just because um, it would probably if you're coding along today. Um, which is optional, of course, but uh, I find people learn more if they do code along. Um, if you want to have Leon's template pulled up so you can easily copy and paste across, um, that might be a good idea. So let me see if I can link to that. I should have done that already, but I didn't. Um, let's see. Just looking to see if it was, nope, not in there. Okay. Um, Ah, here we go. This should be it. Knew it was going to be somewhere. All right. So this should be the link, which, oh, Rascal, in, <laughs> like three people just shared in chat. So yeah, we're going to be kind of pulling elements out of this uh, in order to um, build our end results. Uh, and also, so you're probably going to want to have both of these up so that we can copy and paste stuff. Um, so just FYI. All right. Let's go ahead and get into it. Uh, any questions before we get started? No? Okay, awesome. Well, let's go ahead. Um, so I know that I just said that normally when I am um, building things, I like to you know start with the back end and then move forward. Um, does anybody see the IEG that forms in the GitHub? Uh, I'm not quite sure what you're asking there. IEG. No, I'm not quite sure what you're asking there. Maybe if you ask again, maybe I'll get it. Um, so I know I normally said that I like to start with the back end first when I'm coding from scratch, but in this case, since I'm not too familiar with bootstrap, um, what I am going to do is just go ahead and grab the, um, the views, um, from, uh, the finished product of the, uh, to, of my own code here. So, um, in the restaurant menu tracker, GitHub. I'm just going to go ahead and grab the views from that um, and put them into put just the grab the completed views and put them um, into my new folder here. Oh, just the shape and the text. Okay. I was like, what? <laughs> All right. So I'm going to grab those and pull them over. And then we'll kind of just go I, instead of coding them from scratch, we're just going to kind of look through them and kind of see what's happening there. All right. Oh, 
going to see if I can copy these successfully. Yep, we're going to grab all the views from the uh, restaurant menu tracker GitHub. And then we'll take a look at them. Okay, perfect. So we'll grab those and then let's go ahead and set up um, our other sort of basic files and folders that we're going to need. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and, and we'll, uh, once we've done that, then we'll look and see what's in the views. And so we can build off of that. Um, all right. I'm also going to go ahead and grab my, and build my server.js, just building out the files for now. We're not going to put anything in there yet. Um, and also do our um, NPM setup. Oh, we got a stretch there. Okay. Ah, there we go. Ooh, ooh my neck just cracked a lot. <laughs> that was a good stretch, I guess. Wow. All right. NPM in it. Okay. Um, <laughs> you heard it? Oh my gosh. <laughs> Even the noise canceling couldn't stop that one. Oh boy. Let's get cracking. <laughs> uh, okay, and then we'll also go ahead and s install our um, packages. So we're going to be installing a bunch of things here. I'm going to make my terminal bigger so you can see it. <laughs> so anybody notice the naming convention of the stream team? Leon is the boss, the Lion King. Yeah, absolutely. Mine wolf is in the wolf, Varola fox is in the fox, Rufio is an outlier. Well, Rufio really likes birds. So I don't know if you've ever seen their streams, but they love birds. Um, I think they have like a cockatoo is their like um, kind of symbol for their stream. So I would say definitely birds for them. Um, step, this is going to be mostly in JavaScript. Um, yeah. And then HTML and CSS and all that. Hey, piece of shoot. <laughs> All right, so let's go ahead and start installing some packages as well. I'm going a little bit fast here because I feel like we've done this a lot, right? Like these basic steps, setting, you know, creating a server.js, setting up our packages, that kind of thing. I'm going a little fast, but if you need me to slow down, I can. Um, and you can always look and see which packages you need to install by looking inside of the package.json folder here in the GitHub. So if you get lost on the packages, um, you can just look there. All right, so we're going to install um, bcrypt, connect Mongo, debug, dot env. And some of these will be slightly newer, but that's okay. We're just going to roll with it. EJS, express. I'm just going to install those for starters because I know I tend to make typos and so. Hey, piece of shoot. Um, we're, well, if you want to see the completed code, we're not very far into it. If you want to see the completed code, um, you can go to my GitHub and look for restaurant menu tracker. Um, and that's what we're coding today. Yeah, um, if you clone the whole repo, you don't need npm init, init, right? I'm starting from scratch as far as I didn't clone this down. Um, I am just, you know, kind of coding from scratch versus cloning it. Uh, okay, so we've done express. Uh, we're going to do express flash. Oops. npm install express flash um, express session mongodb mongoose morgan uh, nodemon Hey, we got some new folks joining here, so I'll just uh, show what we're building here in just a second. Nodemon, there we go. Nodemon, Passport. We're not going to use Passport today, but that's going to be in the future, so I'm installing it anyway. Passport, local, and validator. All right. Did I miss? Ah, dang it. I always misspell something. <laughs> Ah, 
All right. That's why I only install a few things at a time because I always make a typo. It's, it's really bad. All right. <laughs> Let's try again. <laughs> All right. We're going to do a few at a time. Express. Flash. Gosh, dang it. Flash. Um, express. Session. If it's any excuse, I'm really sleep deprived. So maybe that's part of it. MongoDB. Mongoose. All right. We'll do those. Mongoose. Um, Morgan, node mon, passport, passport local, and validator. All right. Spelled it right that time. Go for me. All right. Um, all right. Let me catch up with chat here. What is EJS? Um, EJS is just a templating tool. So what it can do is it can help take data from your um, from your server and render it as HTML like dynamically. So if you have a list of items coming from a database, it can render all of those as HTML um, in the browser. Yeah. So EJS helps you do that. It's a it's a templating language that helps you do that. Uh, Dalbum, what are we building today? Yes. Yeah, so we are building. Um, a menu tracker. So what it does is it allows you to log in and then add menus for restaurants that you care about. So um, adding menus, you know, for all your local restaurants all in one place so that you don't have to Google them every single time like I do currently because <laughs> I don't go out to eat very often. So I don't have like these menus memorized or anything like that. Um, and so when I do go out to eat, I don't want to have to Google and try to find all of these places to try to decide where to go. So instead, I can have a list of all these menus, have it on my phone, and just click view menu or tap view menu for each one um, and be able to see that menu immediately. Uh, passport version. Well, we're actually, Goofer, we're actually not going to be using Passport in this stream um, for this app. Uh, that's going to be in a, a, a future iteration of this. Um, so I, we don't, you don't got to worry about the version of it right now. Uh, and Silva, why do you need to fork a repo? Is it better to clone it? Well, I would say like if I'm working with like Leon's code or something like that, I would fork it first so I have my own repo and then clone it down to VS code. So I'm working in my own repo until I'm ready to do a pull request and merge it back with Leon's stuff. Yeah, exactly. I did mode mod. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Abidemi. Uh, we haven't we haven't gone very far. Um, again, the the GitHub repo that we're the thing that we're building today, the finished version is right here. So if you if you if you're a little behind, you're not very you're not very behind. But really, all we've done is just create a server.js file, which is currently empty. Um, install our packages and um, pull over. What we did is we pulled over the views from the finished repo, just because I don't want to type all those from scratch. <laughs> I'm feeling a little lazy today. Yeah, so I um, so this is the end result. Um, and yeah, it's a, it's a pretty cool idea. Um, it, this is based on a YouTube tutorial that I saw. Um, it's been heavily modified um, to kind of have um, a similar format to what we are used to at what 100 Des is teaching. So it's very modified, but it is based on a YouTuber called uh, Coder Kai. Um, so I do want to give them proper credit. Um, Coder Kai right here. Definitely check them out if you want. Because um, yeah, this is, they, they were the inspiration for this idea. Can you export this also as an app? I suppose if you want it to, I, I don't know. I've never done like an actual like app app before. All the stuff that I've built has, has been like, you know, a web app that is viewable, that is usable on mobile. Are you filling out data manually or can the data be grabbed or scraped? I, I mean, you could probably scrape it if you wanted, but for me, it's very curated. So I am literally only adding restaurants that I care about, like me personally, right? This is for, this is like, you know, the stuff, like the restaurants that are restaurants I might want to visit, you know? And so if you wanted to just have a bunch of menus, you could do that, I'm sure. Um, but for me, it's very like personal.
If we follow along via VOD, will the views files be changed when we follow along after the stream? The views files be changed. I'm not quite sure what you're asking. Um, I mean, I will be updating the repo as I make changes. So, um, I mean, I'll be keeping the repo up to date as I make as I improve this app, if that's what you're asking. Okay, so um, we've got our views here. We've got our server.js, which is currently empty. Um, and let's see, I think that's the basics. Now let's just take a quick look inside of these views and kind of see um, see what they're about, see, see how they look, um, get familiar with some of the things that are happening. Um, and then we'll start kind of building out our backend and our routes and all that good stuff. Um, Okay. Yeah, sorry if I'm a little scattered today. Like I said, very sleep deprived, but that's okay. Streaming always make, gives me more energy. <laughs> Eventually. Okay. Uh, your puppy says, so kind of off topic, would you separate your Google OAuth and the OAuth Leon gave us in our files? I tried to separate, but broke my app. Well, I mean, are you trying to do like two different types of authentication, like two different options? Because I think there's probably a strategy for that with Passport. Um, I imagine that there's like a dual like auth strategy. Yeah, so I, I mean, I would look at like what Passport offers as far as strategies rather than trying to implement two side by side. Um, there's probably a combined strategy out there. My mom says IMAX equals worth it. Yeah, you got me. <laughs> I was out real late at that IMAX. <laughs> and then when I came home, I still had to do like feed foster kittens and everything. So it was a late bedtime for me. Yeah, exactly. And Silva, that's the goal. Um, okay. So let's look at these a little bit. So um, the what do we notice here about these views? I'm going to zoom in a little bit. Let me see if I can zoom in. Come on. There we go. Um, so in the view list here, what do we notice about this view list? What do we see here that might look a little bit different than what we're used to seeing? Hey, Trini, I did increase it a little bit. Is that okay for you there? Yeah, we see partials, right? We see partials. Now, what are partials? Well, Partials are pretty cool because you know they were they were in the Traversy tutorial, but if you you might not have caught it. Um, and so what partials are is essentially they are um, like parts of code that can actually be reused and applied like as segments of other views. And so for example, if we look at this, if we open this partial folder, we can see that we have a header and a footer. And so this, what this does is it saves a lot of time for us. Um, by making it much easier for us to, to build our subsequent views, right? Because we can just reuse the same header every single time with the same information in it. So you don't have to keep repeating yourself with every view that you do, right? So let's look at this header real quick. Um, let me make this bigger. All right, so in the header, there's a lot of things going on, right? You've got your head, you've got your, you know, all your links to your style sheets and things like that. Um, and let's just take kind of a gander at what's happening in here. So there's a little script up here, um, which is kind of it's it's helping us with it's helping us um, set up our our add our add new menu menu our add new menu menu. Um, <laughs> there's a little embedded script there. That's okay. Um, and then we have a bunch of divs here, and inside of there, this is what's helping us set up our like drop down menu. So there's that drop down menu where you can click and um, get some content like the logout and um, like the uh, you know add new button and stuff like that. And those features are repeated on every single page, right? Um, and so instead of having to do them over and over again, you can just have a header with these features in it and like all your stuff that's in the head, right? And have that just be applied to every single view that you do. Um, so we've got the login, we've got the logout, um, setting up the drop down menu, 
Um, and what this is doing is it's all it's really doing is checking to see if the user is logged in or if the user is not logged in, then it gives them the option to log in. And um, if they're not, then it shows them the logout menu and it gives them the um, option to add a new restaurant menu item. Yeah, it's reusable code, exactly. The classic EJS templating strategy, header and footer partials. Yeah, and that's the same thing that we saw. So this is this is the kind of cool thing. We saw partials in the Traversy tutorial, right? But Traversy was not using EJS. Traversy was using handlebars, which is a completely different templating language. So what's cool is that you can apply these concepts of partials across multiple templating languages, it, it works, right? It's, it's as long as you, if you understand the concept, you can apply it across multiple different languages. And that works the same for just programming languages in general. So the more concepts you at least have a feel for, the more um, doors you can open more quickly as you learn more languages. So I just thought that was pretty cool. Um, I hadn't seen partials used in EJS, like just in the stuff I'd been looking at before. And I was really hoping it was possible. And then I was like, yay, you can do that. So I was excited to see that. How are the partials and views being rendered across the app? Yeah, we'll look at another, in just a minute, we'll look at one of the full views and see how it's incorporating that header partial. Kind of WordPress, yeah, it's like, you know, you're taking chunks, like you're, you're breaking it out into chunks, reusable chunks, and putting them where they need to go and reusing them multiple times. It's sort of like functions. If it's, it's almost like a function, right? Um, MME says, should we use partials for our group project? If you want to, if you have multiple pages on your app um, and you know that the structure of like the header or the footer or whatever is going to be very similar, um, you, you might, I mean, you could, I wouldn't say you would have to, because I imagine the group project apps are going to be fairly small. So, but you know, I don't know. I don't, I don't know how big, I don't know if you're shooting for the stars or not. <laughs> Reusable code, learned it with a tutorial in the another world open. Yeah, that's why tutorials are so great, right? Some folks feel nervous about using tutorials. I don't. I feel like as long as you use them and then apply them in different ways, like I say, add things, remove things, break things, then you're going to be just fine. Components, yeah. Oh, nice, Goofer, yeah. This is going straight into Anki. Absolutely. Yeah, Moment is pretty great. I've seen a lot of folks using Moment. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so we've seen the head, so header and footer. Right now, there's really not nothing in the footer, um, but you could put something if you wanted to, right? All the footer is really doing is just closing out. You can see these are all closing tags here. It's just closing out all of the end tags. Um, but yeah, you could put a footer in here if you wanted. Um, I'm not going to. Um, all right, so let's see exactly how these partials are incorporated. Um, so if we just look at like index.ejs, um, what this is what this is doing is it's just um, basically showing like, it, this is like the homepage. So it's showing like that list of restaurants, if there are any, um, the edit and the delete and the show menu button, right? Um, but up here at the top, Look how easy that is. Look how easy that is to do, to include that header. How wild is that? So easy. Just say, hey, EJS, include my header, please. And then that takes that takes out all that junk that ends up at the top, right? Like your, um, you know, all that the stuff in the head with all the links and the font awesome and all that. It just takes out all that clutter and puts it somewhere else so you don't have to look at it all the time or scroll past it every time, especially as your headers get bigger and bigger, or as your heads get bigger and bigger. Um, so we can, we can include that there. Um, and then at the bottom, we just include our footer and et voila, we are good to go. So I really like that. I'm probably gonna use that a lot now going forward. <laughs> go, get, go full foodie and call the header top bread and footer bottom bread. Yeah, exactly. They are, they're the bread in our sandwich, right? And we want to just, we want to focus on the ingredients that go into the sandwich. I think I've used that analogy before. Yeah. Hazel says, I usually watch a tutorial, but build my own thing just using the new concepts that they show. Sure. Yeah. You could absolutely, if that works better for you, you can do it that way too. Okay. Uh, so 
what's happening in here. So we have our header, we're including that. Um, and the first thing that's up top here, this is actually um, a our search box. And what it's doing is it's doing a post um, to do that search. And we'll see how that works on the, on the back end once we start getting there. Um, but it's really just submitting a form with a specific query action. Um, and, you know, giving it a name of search input, a type of text. Um, and it, and we just have a little bit of EJS here that's just saying, hey, if the search is empty, then, or sorry, if the search is not empty, then the value should equal like the value that was searched for, I guess. <laughs> so if the search was not empty, keep that, keep the search value in there. Um, and then while you're showing the results so that you can remember what, what you searched for. And then there's just the button to submit. And that, that makes up the search box that was at the top of our app. So just this right here. Search box. This is just a form. It's nothing special. It's just a form. You click submit and it does a search and it brings back the results. That's all it is. All right. And then down here, we actually have it where it's going to start listing out each of the rows with all of our restaurants on them. Um, and this is so very similar to actually what we've done before, for example, with Leon's um, MBC off code, right? The to-do list code. Um, all it does is just loops through the list of items that it's getting back from the database, right? It's looping through and it's doing stuff to each one and it's setting them up as a list. So nothing earth shattering here either. It, I, I wanted to kind of emphasize that because this looks kind of complicated, but it really isn't. It's just, again, looping through items in a list, um, applying some additional attributes and formatting um, and just listing them out. And so we have a little bit of, uh, you know, flex stuff going on here. Um, and essentially all it's doing is just for each item that it's getting back from the database, it's taking the URL, um, it's setting up the icons, um, it's grabbing the menus, and it's setting, a, uh, it's setting up an edit button, it's setting up a delete button, and it's linking the, um, the menu URL so that when you click on that little book icon, it takes you to the menu URL. And it's adding some text to say view menu, and that's all it's doing. So nothing crazy, just laying out the, laying out the information. Uh, and Silva, yeah, that's a great question, and Silva. So the whole HTML header where you link CSS and fonts, it's actually in the header portion. Yeah, it is. Yep. And all, as long as we reference it here, as long as we say, hey, include this, we can, we, only, we can just tuck it away and we don't have to look at it, which I think is great. And another great thing too, is that having that stuff in the partials um, can also help make sure that you don't forget to like link a, link a style sheet or link a script, right? Like let's say that in my app, um, I decided at one point I wanted to include, I wanted to add Font Awesome and I hadn't been using Font Awesome before, I wanted to add it, so I would have to link to link, you know, to those, to, to the, the font awesome, um, you know, uh, library, right? And so if I wasn't using partials, I would have to do that on every single view. I have to, you know, make sure that I include that on every single view. But with the partials, I can just link it once and then apply it across all my views. Yeah, this is becoming a puzzle really cool. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's Legos all the way down, right? Yeah. Yep, so all of these are referencing this header, and so you only gotta do it once. Yep. All right, so the index is really just setting up the search box, and it's setting up the individual restaurants that it gets back from the database. Um, okay. The others are, um, so we also have the login here, and again, we're including our header, and we have a form that really just has two fields. It has the email field and the password field. And it's doing a post request um, to do the login. And if there's any errors, it will go ahead and display those errors. 
Um, and it also links to our new account page. If people click that, you know, no login, create a new account, this will take them to the um, new account page instead. Yep, so this is very simple, just a simple form. Um, I, what I really like is, you know, seeing how often forms are applied across these apps. Um, they're so, they can be so versatile, right? You can disguise them in lots of different ways, but you can use forms for a lot of stuff. <laughs> uh, Tainted says, so you're tracking menus from various restaurants? Yeah, this is really just like, um, you know, there, there's always that, Leon always says that you should, um, find, like look for something, right? Like see a need that in your life or something that you dislike um, and try to make an app that serves, that fills that need or, or solves that problem. And so for me, a problem is that I don't go out to eat very often. And so I don't know the menus of the restaurants in my area and I have to Google them every single time and that gets really annoying. And so what this app will do is it'll let me put in the menus all in one place. And so I can just click down through them and see what I might like, what, what I might want to eat. Yeah. Oh, Tucker, thank you so much. Wow. <laughs> thank you so much. Six months subscribed. Thank you so much, Tucker. I really appreciate it. Oh, boy. Okay. Uh, so the logins, you know, pretty self-explanatory. Um, same with new account. Again, very similar. Just another form. Um, and what it's doing is it's looking for, you know, just creating a new account instead. So really the main difference here between the login and the new account um, is that it's sending the request to a different path, right? So if you look here, look at the path, um, the login form is going to just log in and the um, sign up is going to log in slash new. So on the back end, we're gonna have routes that are listening and that path is going to, you know, one's gonna go to the login path and the other one is gonna go to login and then new. So they're going to end up in a different place, even though they're, you know, both post uh, methods with forms that are asking for the same information, but they're going to end up in different locations. All right. And it's asking for, you know, email and password. But another thing here is um, it has a little additional styling where it says it's required information, right? It's not going to be accepted if you don't um, type in a valid username and password or email and password. And then there's a submit button. It'll display any errors if there's errors. Um, and then a, a redirect back to the login page that people can go there if they need to. Why is the align attribute red? I don't know. Um, is that working? Well, let's see if it worked. Let's see if that's, um, let's just look at that real quick. All right, so, um, oh, did I not click that? There we go. All right, log out. All right, let's see. What do I log in? We're on new account. No, it seems to be working. Yeah, because it's it says align center and the button is align center. So must just be a VS code formatting weirdness because um, it did work. MD Res says, hi, Mind Wolf. You just gave me a fantastic idea. I'll make it for my area. You're from London. Oh, yeah. See, this would be really great for people that live in like larger metropolitan areas um, where there's so many restaurants and you probably only have a few that you really go to regularly. Um, and so, yeah, you should definitely do this for, for London. Um, as when I was there, it seemed like there was restaurants every, you know, 10 feet. <laughs> or what, what would it be in meters? I don't know. I want to be like metric. <laughs> Hey, Rask, welcome to the stream. <laughs> you use Uber Eats, look all through all the restaurants in a searchable way, then go to then go to the restaurant and get food. That's awesome. <laughs> finally, the finally a good use for Uber Eats. Why not using input required? Well, because we're making sure that they like we have that in the schema. Um, I mean, you could, you could, you could, you could validate that here on the front end, um, but we have additional checks for that in the back end, and, and we're going to put those in the schema as well. So it'll be checked for in multiple places. Uh, 
Rascal says, there must be something in the air in the last few days. Had Chow Co's doing a restaurant picking app. Seeing Griffin doing the food juicing app. Now we're doing a menu app. We're just all really hungry. <laughs> food app's so hot right now. Yeah. Okay. So again, very simple. Like these, these, these look complicated when you first look at them, right? But mostly it's just forms. It's just forms that are going to different routes, which we've seen a bunch of times before. So it's just forms asking for different information being applied in different ways, you know, going to different routes, right? And then on the main page, it's really just a loop that's looping through the data that it gets back from the database and listing it out. So it's not that much different from the basic to-do app that Leon demonstrated. Um, so we've got new account, we had login. Uh, let's look at menu. So what this is, is the um, menu creation screen. So when you say add new menu, um, this will take you to the menu creation screen and you can put in the details of the, um, uh, the restaurant that you want to add. Forms are so important. Yeah, they are. I'm, I'm beginning to see that forms are really like the lifeblood of all applications. Like without forms, where would we be, honestly? Imagine if you had to do everything as separate input boxes and like do a fetch, like, and do like a fetch on each one. Gosh, that would suck. Feed the devs, yeah. <laughs> all right, so this one is where, you, again, we have another form, right? And it's going to the, the route of menu slash save with a post. Um, and what this is doing here is it's, um, it's really just um, asking for the information about the menu item, right? Um, name, icon, URL. Actually, I think this might be the edit screen. Let me just see here. Yeah, the class is menu edit. So um, yeah, this is actually the, um, this is actually the menu edit screen. Um, because yeah, I saw that it was grabbing the uh, item name, the existing item name, icon, and uh, URL. Yeah, it's only grabbing one, so that's why it has item zero. So it's grabbing the one item, it's putting those in as the default values, and then you can edit them as you go. And then you submit it when you're done. And it's also, what's interesting here too, is it's also, um, when you do an update, it's also passing back the ID value from the database, except it's hidden, so you can't see it. I love being able to grab all inputs with rec.body. Yeah, that's my favorite, that's awesome. It's pretty much, yeah, exactly. And Silva, it's, and Silva says it's pretty much a to-do list with a different use. And I agree, I, that's why I think Leon, you know, gave us the to-do list to start with, because apps are really just really fancy to-do lists, right? <laughs> they're just they're just adding things to a database and reading it back and changing it and reading it back and deleting it and reading it back, right? Most apps are to-do list indeed. Hey, Tainted, welcome. Uh, yeah, uh, good luck on your app. Um, it's cool you're using SQL. I'm a SQL dev, so good luck on that. <laughs> Most apps are to-do list, indeed. <laughs> yep. Okay. Um, so really just kind of wanted to show you that these, these there's, there's several views here, but none of them are particularly complicated. They're mostly just forms or loops. Um, and the last thing here is just an error page. And so if there is an error, it will render this error page and it will render the error information, status, stack. Um, if something goes wrong, when something goes wrong, um, it'll just render this instead. So cool. I didn't want to code those from scratch, which is, you know, kind of why we just went through it that way. Um, are we writing this code live or is there a repo? There is a repo. Um, we copied the view. We're going to code some of it from scratch, but as far as the views go, um, there's a lot of room for error there. Um, so we just copied those over from the repo and just kind of reviewed what was happening. So let me see. Let me get it here. Sorry. All right. Here's the finished code. And what we did was we just copied the views and dropped them, all the views, everything in the views folder and just dropped it into uh, our new app here. 
when you say you're a SQL dev, do you mean you work on the MySQL project or MariaDB or something? So I work for um, a major university um, and I do PL SQL Oracle, um, database coding, um, doing like ETL and stuff for, for a lo very large <laughs> university database. So it's not, I don't use SQL for app development. Um, what I've been using for app development is uh, NoSQL, MongoDB stuff. But for my day job, I uh, use Oracle SQL for, for large scale database projects. Okay, so we've gone through the views. Um, it's about time for us to take a break, but let's do a few other little setup things first. We'll take a break and then we'll come back and we'll actually get to doing typey things with our fingers. Um, hey, Jim. <laughs> All right, so let's do a little bit more setup. Um, so we have our server.js file, but what are some of the other things that we're gonna need in order to get our app up and running? What are some of the basic things that we're going to need in every single app that we build or, or if every single full app stack app that we build? What are some of the common denominators across all of our full stack projects so far that we're still going to need? <laughs> Git ignore, sure. Yeah, we can add that. Hit ignore. Okay, we're gonna put some stuff in there. Uh, <laughs> yes, and our .env file exactly. So um, we're gonna we're gonna put something in our Git ignore in just a minute. But um, first, I'm also gonna add a config folder um, to put our .env and our database connection information in there. So config folder, and inside of the config folder, I'm gonna add .env. Okay, and now inside of my git ignore, um, I'm gonna go ahead and add my, before I forget, I'm gonna add my .env to my git ignore. And so for, in order to do that, I can just say config um, slash dot e, env, there we go. And um, that'll be in, that. so that'll be there before I push and forget about it. Yeah, uh, let's see what else are people saying here. Env, get ignore. Yep, routes. Make sure all packages are installed. Yeah, so multi hyphenate, we, we already did install our packages. Um, so you can always see the list of packages that we installed by looking at the repo and looking in the package.json folder if you'd like to uh, see what we installed. But yeah, that's a great thing to check is to make sure that you have installed the packages. Otherwise, you're going you're gonna to have some problems, right? <laughs> Um, Dina says, does it also work if it's um, .env or if it needs the path config.env? Well, um, if you had it at the root, you could just say .env. Um, but since we have it in the folder, you, I think you'll need the, the folder name and then .env. Or were you saying, if does it work if it's wildcard.env? Um, I don't know. If you use the wildcard indicator, does anybody know if that works? If you just say wildcard.env? So yeah, Mama Hum, so the reason we do config slash env is because we have it in a in a subfolder. Um, but if you just had it at the root, like down here, um, you could just say env. Uh, oh, nice. Okay, that's rad. Uh, so Ray Anthony, you want to be careful if you say config wildcard just because we're gonna be putting like our database connection information, like without the without the connection string, we're gonna be putting that inside of there um, also. So you wanna make sure you wouldn't exclude that if you pushed up to GitHub. <laughs> Zena says, we had some issues on the team with pushing the .env to the GitHub repo. Yeah, I would imagine. <laughs> Yeah, so the, some folks are saying that it does work without saying config um, slash env. I mean, I don't know. I feel like I want to be if I want to be sure that I'm not going to accidentally push it, so I just go ahead and put that there. But I'm not going to tell you how to live your life. Piece of sheet says if you just say .env, it looks for that specific file everywhere. Okay, awesome. Yeah, and we're also going to want to um, ignore our node modules. Yep. Node modules. Yep. Um, 
And then I'm going to go ahead and save this. Perfect. Config, ENV, node modules, ignored. All right, so those are the only two things that we're going to ignore for this particular project. Um, and if you do have your file that linked to like a either a local repo um, or if you like cloned it down, if it's linked to a rem remote repo, um, you'll see these files. I, if you haven't noticed before, um, you'll see these files change color to like a very pale gray once you do add them to your Git ignore and save that. So that can help you remember whether or not you've added these guys to your Git ignore. Um, is if you see them, if you if you are hooked up to a, to a Git repo, you'll see these guys turn like a lighter color of gray, which can be really helpful. Hey, can I install every package in one NPM install line? I suppose I don't put comments between packages. Yeah, you can just, you can do that. Um, just make sure you spell it right. Like we saw earlier, if you make one typo, everything will crash and burn. So um, if you're gonna, if you're gonna YOLO that, uh, just be careful. Uh, <laughs> But if you mess up, you can just try again. Um, yeah, you can do it all in one line. Just put spaces in between the packages. So you can just do NPM I and then your package list. <laughs> That's why you see REST files in quite a few of my projects. I always forget to exclude them. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so we've got the we've got the real important stuff here. Uh, config node modules, perfect. Um, let me see here. What else do we want to add? Um, let's go ahead and take a break. Uh, but when we get when we get back, we're gonna do um, what we're gonna do when we get back is we're gonna set up our database connection, um, and we're gonna start setting up our. Well, actually, I think we'll, the server.js is not gonna take very long. So I think what we're gonna do when we get back is we'll set up our database connection and we will set up our server.js, and then we will start doing our routes. Um, and we're gonna kind of build the routes off of what we have here in the views. Um, so gonna kind of work inward this time. And I know I said already that when I'm building things from scratch, I like to work outward from, you know, from the back end forward. But in this case, we're gonna kind of work inward from the views to the back end since we already have the views populated. Um, Oh, and another, we also need to add our public files too. So when we get back, we're going to add our database connection, our public files, and we're going to add fill out our server.js. All right, so we're going to take a five minute break because we like to be healthy. Um, I'm going to get some more hydration, and then we'll keep on going, keep on trucking, as they say. <laughs> Groovy, indeed. All right. Let me. Get that timer pulled up. Five minute timer. All right. Reset and start. And I will see you back in five minutes. I'm going to go make some more tea.
Okay, folks, we got a minute, about a minute left in the break. So come on back if you're coming back. And I will see everybody back here shortly. Got a nice fresh cup of tea. Got to wait for it to cool down a little bit. But what matters is I have it. Has anybody done anything interesting uh, so far over the Labor Day weekend for folks that uh, do have the Labor Day holiday this weekend? Hey, Jessica, welcome to the stream. Good to have you here. Just finishing up our break. Thank you for the follow, Hassan. All right, gonna stop the timer here with five seconds remaining. Newbie says, hi, Mayan. Welcome, watching your Google Off VOD, the 12 hour series. Yes, that's a classic. 12 hours, indeed. It's wild. <laughs> uh, using Kotlin, you're learning Kotlin. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, most of the folks that um, are here on this stream, we are members of 100 Devs, um, which is a web development free um, free course that's just taught on Twitch. Um, I'm not one of the teachers, but I am kind of like a helper. Um, we're community taught. Um, and if you want to learn more, you can always type exclamation point Leon in the chat and learn more about it. It's completely free, um, just community taught uh, learning about web development. So pretty cool. Uh, and if anybody would like to follow along with the code that we're doing today, um, here's the repo for that. It's the finished product. So you can code along or you can just look at the finished product. That's up to you. <laughs> yeah, I guess I'm kind of like a TA, I, I suppose. I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, if you want to learn more, um, there's some links for you, the, the website, the Discord, uh, and the Twitch channel. Okay, so before the break, we set up our getignore, we set up our, we, we set up our .env file and we're gonna put some stuff in it. Um, and let's also go ahead, before we forget, let's go ahead and set up our, um, our public folders as well. Um, now, what is a, so pop quiz, what is a public folder? What, what, are we, what are the types of things that we use a public folder for? What are some reasons we would have a public folder? I'm gonna go ahead and add that. Static files, front end CS, front end JS and CSS. Oh, I need to turn my camera on. I'm sorry. There we go. <laughs> I'm still here. I promise. Uh, uh, static files, client side scripts and styles. Static files, clients. Yeah, exactly. Assets. Yeah, Hazel. That's a great way to put it. Assets too. Yeah. Um, right. So a few of the things that we're going to put in our public file, um, public folder today. So we're going to have. Um, we're gonna have a style sheet. So I'm gonna go ahead and just add a style sheets folder. Style sheets, there we go. Um, and then I'm also going to add a folder for images. Um, not in the, not in there. So we're gonna have both images and style sheets inside of our public folder. And that's the cool thing. I mean, you can add, you know, just multiple different types of things inside of this public folder. And, our, and as long as we tell our code where to find it, um, our code can just look in the public folder and get everything it needs in order to do that sort of styling and, you know, static files that, that we might want. Um, so yeah, you could also have just plain HTML in here. Um, now, a lot of folks, you know, get it twisted as far as, wait, I thought, you know, we were, we were using EJS, but there are times when you might want to have just some static HTML if you, if you don't need any sort of dynamic content, you know, on your page. So in that case, you could just put it in your public folder, or you could just use EJS for everything. <laughs> that works too. No worries, Zena. Good to have you. Okay. So those are the, so we're going to put images in here, style sheets in here. Perfect. Um, and let's go ahead and set up 
our database connection as well. So inside of our config folder, let's go ahead and add a new file called uh, database.js. Whoop, not in there. Now, I know in the past, a lot of the times we would put our database connection directly inside of our server.js folder. Um, but the cool thing is we can kind of offload that connection um, to its own file and then just reference that inside of our server.js as a, as a function. So it becomes one line instead of, you know, I don't know, six or seven or 10 lines um, that are cluttering up our server.js file. Because the cool thing about, you know, the MVC structure and kind of compartmentalizing things is that you can make the individual files a lot smaller and make them a lot easier to troubleshoot and work on um, by breaking them out into logical pieces. Yeah. Okay, so inside of database.js, um, I'm not gonna make this very complicated. Uh, what I'm gonna do is just grab the code from the uh, from Leon's uh, MVC off from Leon's MVC off code and just plunk that right in there because it doesn't have to be any different. We don't have to change anything. We can just grab this code and dunk it right in there. And if you prefer, you can just grab. You can also grab this connection code from the finished repo of my code um, and just dump that in. Can't be simpler than copy and paste. Exactly, exactly, right? And people, sometimes people feel bad about copying and pasting, right? They're like, oh, I, I feel like I needed to copy this, you know, type this stuff out. Not if you're going to be using it for every single app and, you know, that you ever make until the end of time. Like, just, just copy and paste it. <laughs> it's okay. True knowledge is knowing where, what to copy and where to paste it, right? It's not that you can memorize all this stuff and, and do it from scratch. And so since I installed Mongoose from scratch here, um, we'll see, but I, I may need to get rid of all of these properties here. Um, since I did a package install from scratch, um, I probably installed the latest version of Mongoose. And so it's probably not gonna like this, but we'll see when we run it. Um, we'll see if we'll see what, what juicy errors we get. <laughs> um, actually, I'm gonna go ahead and take it out and just, um, I'm just gonna go ahead and just get rid of all this. Because newer versions of Mongoose um, don't need, you know, those extra properties. Type everything in binary. <laughs> Flight Rose says, I'm sorry for not talking in chat. I'm kind of nervous. Well, welcome, Flight. Good to have you on the stream. Man, we've got like, you know, we've got tons of folks that, that never say a word in chat. And that's totally fine. Don't worry about it. Don't feel like you have to say anything. We've got folks that, you know, just have me playing in their headphones while they're, you know, driving or whatever, and they never talk in chat. So don't worry about it. No worries at all. Yeah. And so I think we probably have the latest version of Mongoose. So we can just do this instead of having all those additional properties. <laughs> Code says, I'm a long time worker. Don't worry. Absolutely. Lur long time lurker. Don't worry. Absolutely. We've only, you know, we've got 126 viewers on the, on the stream right now. And I would, you know, probably only you know, 20 or so regular chatters, right? Lurking and working. Yeah, that's the way to do it. Julian says, I've just definitely had this on while driving. <laughs> I hope you're not typing in chat while you're driving, Julian. <laughs> okay, so let's try that. We're just going to YOLO it and imagine that'll probably work. So all I did was just remove the extra properties. And so that way our connection really just has our db string in it. Now, now that I have this connection information in here, what do, what am I missing in what we've built so far? What am I missing in order to make this connection work? What, what's, what's the missing piece that I don't have yet in my code that I need in order for us to be able to establish a connection to the database? What's missing? Tobina says, hi, non-chatter here. Hey, Tobino. <laughs> perfectly fine to just be hanging out. Car drives itself now anyway. Ooh, fancy. My car does not drive itself. <laughs> Environment variable. Yeah, we're going to need our database credentials, our DB string. Exactly. And we're going to put that inside of our .env file, right? <laughs> Y'all are funny. Okay, so I'm just going to go ahead and grab db string. Go into my .env, 
and set up a variable here. And I'm going to grab my DB string. I'm going to get it from my completed version of the app. However, um, you can get it by logging into your MongoDB cluster and um, saying and clicking on connect and then saying connect application and grabbing the string from there. I think most of us have probably done this by now, but if anybody would like me to go over where you find your connection string, um, just let me know and I gladly will do it. So no worries if you want me to go over that, I'm happy to do it. Now I'm gonna paste my connection string here. I'm perfectly aware that I'm sharing it, um, but I'm doing that so folks know what it looks like and know what they might need to change. So doing this consciously, um, just please don't touch my database. I trust you, you're awesome, okay. Trini, Trini says, please do. Okay, no worries at all. So I'll do that in just a second. Let's just look at this string real quick. So um, db string equals, and here I have my username. Here I have my password. It's You can see it's between the colon and the at sign, password. And here, this is kind of a new thing that, that might be easy to forget if you're not paying attention. Um, this is this. What, what do we have here that's between the slash and the question mark? What What is this? What do we think this is? Sorry, right there. What 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 uh, element? So th this is clearly something that I've named, right? Like I've this is something that I've done that I've put into this string. But what is it doing? What, what is it? Okay, so we got a lot of guesses. Some folks are saying it's a collection. Some folks are saying it's a database name. Collection, database, collection, database. Okay, so it seems like we're kind of evenly split on whether this is a collection or a database. So let's let's see if we can figure that out. Because I think, it, you know, the, 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 the hierarchy of MongoDB can, can be kind of confusing for folks as far as like when we say, you know, a cluster or a collection or a document or a database, what is that and where does it fit in the hierarchy of information that is stored inside of a MongoDB database? So I think that's worth taking a look at. And we'll also look at where you find your connection string too for Trinae there. All right. And for anybody else that needs it. Um, so let's pop over to Mongo here real quick. Um, and so here on the main screen, um, if I wanted to find my database connection string, I've logged in and I'm just going to say connect. So just click the connect button and then just say connect your application. And here's my string and I'm just going to copy that and paste it in. Um, however, you can see it doesn't put in your password automatically. You need to add that. So you need to just replace everything here with the carrots included, like the left and right arrows included. Take that out, replace it with your password. And then you'll also add this mysterious thing that we're investigating. You'll add that between the slash and the question mark. So copy and paste that, put it in your .env file, and then you know change the password and add this other element. So let's look at that. Let's see, let's see if we can figure out what that element is. All right, I've got a lot of stuff in here, but um, so here I am inside of my cluster, right? I'm inside of my cluster. Oh, we got a stretch. All right, there we go. No more net cracks this time. <laughs> I think I, I think, uh, probably cracked a vertebrae there that last time. Yeah. Uh, okay. So we're inside of our cluster. All right. So that's the biggest, um, that's the biggest element, right? That's the biggest bucket. And then the next level down is right here. All of these here. So what are these? What is, the, what is this list of things? I have a lot of them. You might not have very many. That's okay. What are, what are these here on the left? Databases, indeed. Yes, these are our databases. And then what is inside? what's inside of our databases? If I were to expand this, what are these? Collections, right. And then if I expand this, what are these? Hmm. <laughs> 
<laughs> documents. Yeah, exactly. So that's the hierarchy, right? And just like Goo4G pasted, we've got our cluster. Inside of the cluster, we've got our databases. Inside of the databases, we've got our collections. Inside of the collections, we've got our documents. If that is not in your Anki, put it in there right now. You got to know what this hierarchy is. Okay, so after looking at that hierarchy, there's a little bit of a clue here. What is this mystery element that I am adding to my database string? What is that? What is this, what is this connecting to? It's the database name, exactly. Yes. So if you so so just kind of you can kind of visualize that, right? So we connect to our cluster first, right here. This is our cluster. And then inside of that cluster, we want to point to a specific database to which we will be adding collections and documents as we go. Yep. Uh, Hertz, I think you might be limited. If you're making multiple clusters, I think you might be limited on the number that you can create. I've had two before, um, but I think there might you might encounter some limitations there eventually. I don't know how many you can have. I mean, honestly, I would just stick to one cluster um, with multiple databases inside of it, right? That's what I would do. Just one cluster, multiple databases. It makes it easier to handle passwords and accounts and that kind of thing. Um, and speaking of that, somebody asked about passwords. Uh, so if you need to change um, a password, you forget your password, or I you know, change passwords after streams, um, you can go to security, database access, click the edit button, and then just say edit password. And then once you've chosen a new password, make sure you copy it. And then you have to click update user. I don't know if you can see that. It's probably behind my head, but there is an update user button. Here, I'll go over here. There's an update user button that you have to click after you make changes. Otherwise, it won't stick. Um, and that's tripped multiple people up. They, they change their password. They wonder why it's not working because they didn't click update user. Uh, what if you, um, yeah, Big Bada Boom asked, what if you don't specify the database you want to interact with? Well, if you don't, MongoDB will take it upon them upon itself to create one for you. And it will create a database called test, as Rascal just said there. Um, and so you can see, if we look at my collections, you can, you can spot when I learned that that was the case. Because um, yes, I definitely have a database called test with a bunch of to-do items in it because I didn't understand what was happening. <laughs> Hey, Reborn, uh, we are building an application that allows you to um, put in, to add restaurant menus for like your local area and add links to those menus, um, store them in a database and, you know, retrieve them and, and, and you know, click on, click on each of these and view the menu for the restaurant that you would like to visit. Um, so it's really a kind of just a, an app that I think I'm going to use in my daily life um, because I hate Googling restaurant menus. <laughs> so it's just kind of a curated list of restaurants that I enjoy um, that I can add to continuously as I go. Okay. So, um, so yeah, we can see that the, the, my current version of the app is writing to a database called Menu Tracker. And then inside of that, we have these multiple collections. And now what helps us, so, in our connection string, right, we specified um, a specific database, but we didn't specify a collection. So what is going to help us specify which collection we want to add something to? Yeah, it uses the schema name, exactly. So for collections, Mongoose is gonna help us with that when we set up our individual schemas. Mongoose is going to create then the connection, sorry, the collections, because as long as we've connected to our database, Mongoose, Mongoose, <laughs> Mongoose knows where to go, right? Knows where to put the data. And then um, Mongoose is going to um, create individual collections as needed based on which schema we hit. Hey, serious. Okay, cool. So we should have, 
we should have our database string sorted out. Again, we've got our username, we've got our password, um, we've got the database that we want to hit. I'm actually going to create a new database here. I'm just going to call it Menu Tracker 3, um, just because I already have an existing database and I want to build to a new one here. So I'm just changing that to Menu Tracker 3 for my own use. You can call your database whatever you want. Uh, you don't have to create the database in MongoDB beforehand. MongoDB is smart enough that it will make it for it will create it for you as long as you specify it here. So that's pretty clever. I really like that feature. It's nice. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and save this. Cool. Um, and then you can also, if you want to, you can specify a port. I'm going to specify 8500 and drop that in there as well. Okay, so we've got our database set up. We've got our public folder ready to drop things into. Um, inside of our database connection setup here, we're exporting this as a function. So we're setting up the function here, and then we're exporting it. So that way we can call it, call that function elsewhere inside of our server.js and just have it execute right away and establish the database connection. Mangoes, yeah. <laughs> okay, got that, perfect. Just making sure I've got everything else here. We'll set up our, we weren't gonna set up our schemas yet. We'll set those up in a little bit. Yeah, so let's go ahead and go to our server.js and start setting that up. All right, so in server.js, um, we're gonna copy and paste a lot of this. We're gonna copy and paste a lot of this from Leon's code. So the cool thing about doing things in MVC, right? Like we said before, you can take a lot of things and compartmentalize them out. So take them out and put them in separate locations. And what that helps you do is make certain parts of your code much more reusable. And so since server.js is so stripped down, we've taken everything out of it. Um, we can really just copy and paste it and it'll work um, with small modifications and it'll work for almost, you know, any app that we want to build. Um, so that's what we're going to do here. I'm going to go back to Leon's code to the uh, MVC auth local tutorial. I'm going to go back up to the root here and I'm just going to grab server.js. Just going to go to the, Go to the you know server.js file. I'm just gonna grab it. Beep. Copy. Plug and play, indeed. That's exactly right. Copy and paste. Hooray! And now we're gonna kind of go through this and curate it a little bit and and you know make sure that we have everything that we need. But control C, control V, baby. Let's do it. Let's go. Uh, Mama says, we're not used to the test thing with databases where it defaults to the test database because we're used to naming them in our server file code. Yeah, exactly. When we connected to the database in the olden days with just MongoDB instead of Mongoose, um, we did specify our database name um, in, you know, just in our server.js. But now we're going to go ahead and just specify it in the database string. Mongoose can connect. All of our related, you know, dependencies and stuff can connect. And it's all one big happy family in the way back in the before times. Yeah. The olden days when we were, you know, when we, when we knew nothing. And uh, yes, now we are, now we are enlightened to the ways of Mongoose indeed. Mongoose is great, isn't it? So nice. We coded uphill both ways. Yeah, the snow was two feet deep, coding uphill both ways, exactly. Okay, so let's just take a quick cruise through our dependencies here. Um, just making sure that we have what we need, connect Mongo, Flash. And that's not to say that we're gonna use all of these. That's not to say that we're gonna use every single one of these, but if we require something and end up not using it, it's not a big deal. Nubis says, what was the command to install the framework's dependencies? Um, just npm install. And then um, you can, there's two ways you can do it. You could, um, you know, you could copy the, the package.json file from the, the repo and add that to your code and then just do npm install. Or you could go through the package list and 
install each one individually. You could do NPM install, you know, every single package that way. It's up to you. Uh, so we got Flash, we got Logger, we've got ConnectDB. Now this one's important because since we built this function, this ConnectDB function in another location, we're going to have to require it in our current file, in our server.js file, we're gonna have to require it in order for us to be able to use it. So just, we have to require this just like all of our other packages here. We've required it, so now we can use it. And then I'm also going to be setting up some routes here too. Um, so for now, what I'm gonna do, th these routes here, this main route and to-do route, these are associated with the to-do app or whatever. So I'm just gonna get rid of these for now. We're gonna be adding back several different you know, new routes, but we're just gonna get rid of these for now. We'll, we'll add them back um, with, our, with our new app layout. Okay, we've got our .env file. We're telling the code where to find it, which is in config.env, perfect. Um, we're not gonna be using Passport just yet. So I'm gonna go ahead and comment that out just so it you know doesn't freak out when it doesn't find a Passport file. So just commenting that out so you don't get an error. I am gonna put it back eventually. I'm just not ready to do that yet. Um, so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to call our ConnectDB function. So perfect. What that'll do is it'll just run the database connection. And then we're going to set up some middleware. So we've got our view engine, which is telling our code that we are using EJS, and that's what's going to be rendering our pages. We're telling our code where to find um, our static files, which is going to be in the public folder. Cool telling it how to parse URLs, JSON. Um, and then the last one is something a little bit new, um, which is the logger. Um, and so this is this is working with Morgan, which is um, essentially a logging tool that gives us more detailed logs about what's happening inside of our app. And we're setting the dev um, uh, configuration of Morgan. So that way it gives us really detailed logs of each time we, we click on a page, it tells us what's happening um, and the status. Okay, so really, I'm not, I mean, I'm not really changing much here, right? I got rid of some of the routes that were up here, the existing routes, because we're going to add our own. Rid of, got rid of these routes. I commented out Passport for now. Um, but I'm leaving the rest of this stuff alone because It'll work. It's it's so you know, it's modular, right? We're modular. We're modular. Okay. The next thing is we're setting up our session. Not changing anything there. That'll work. Um, we're gonna go ahead and comment out this passport middleware for now. Okay. Commented out the passport stuff. Um. We can use Flash, that's fine. And we have some routes here. We're gonna add our own routes. So I'm just gonna make a quick note here. Add routes here, get rid of the existing routes because again, we're gonna make our own. And then the last thing is we're going to start our server. <laughs> So you can see, I really only changed like five lines in this, you know, server.js. I, I commented out some stuff, but as far as actual changes, I really only changed a couple things. And that's all we need in order to build this completely different app that does something completely different than the to-do list, right? It still works though. It's modular. That's what I love. All right. Um, what is logger? What does it do? Well, the logger is Morgan. Um, and Morgan just helps give you more detailed logs. It tells you more information about what's happening in your application. There's a lot of different ways you could configure it. Um, we're just kind of using it in its like semi-default state. Um, just to give us some more information as we visit various pages, it tells us exactly what path is being sent, um, what the status is that we get back, um, which can be really helpful when you're trying to diagnose what the heck your app is doing when something isn't behaving as expected. Yeah. Yeah, it is really nice, Hertz, isn't it? Yep. If it worked for thee, it'll work for me, right? 
that's true, right? It why re, you don't gotta reinvent the wheel. You don't gotta just use what's already there. In this case, we're using what Leon gave us. Okay, we've got that. We've got our server set up. Perfect. So that's pretty much it for our server.js. We're pretty much done with that. Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it is cool. Oops, that's the wrong one. Sorry, wrong window. I've got I've got too many VS Code windows open right now. I need to close some of them. Okay. So now let's think about, so let's think about our routes because we have our server, right? Our server is listening for just everything coming in from the client side of the application. Our server is just listening for all that stuff, um, everything coming in, and but it needs to know where to send it, right? So the server is like the hub. The server is just bringing everything in and you know it's initializing all the stuff it needs to initialize and all that. Um, but then it needs to know where to send the information that it receives. And so inside of our server.js, we're going to need to add some routes, which are going to pass this data off to various additional routers, which will then pass it off to additional controllers. Now, if we're thinking about MVC, right, we've got our model, we've got our view, we've got our controller. Um, and so our server kind of forms the hub. We pass that information off to the routers, which pass it off to controllers, which interact with the model, which interact with the database, and then send data back to the views. Well, I guess through the controllers to the views, yeah. So it's kind of, it, it becomes a chain, right? Yeah, uh, Nubish says, if I just copy the package.json, I'm good to go. Yeah, you could do that. And then just do npm install to actually install those packages. Mama says, I love that all this makes sense to me now. That's awesome. Yeah, that's really cool. It does have a sort, it does have a, a sort of logic, right? Okay, so the server's the hub but we gotta add some routes so that our server knows where to send stuff. So routes can be kind of subjective, um, but in this case, since we already have our views written out, um, we can kind of look to our views to see what routes we might need in order to make sure that we're handling all the requests that we're getting from the client side. <laughs> all right, so let's look, at, let's look at our views and get a feel for some of the routes that we might be dealing with. Uh, okay, so let's look at the header. And we'll just kind of look for when we spot some routes. Okay, so here I see one. This is slash login. And I see one below it, which is just slash login slash log out. So these are clearly related routes, right? One logs you in, the other one logs you out. So we're probably going to need something related to that. Now, pop quiz, is this something that my server needs to handle? Do I need to create a specific route or router for this? They look very similar. <laughs> exactly, no, that's correct. What, what, why not? What is this referencing? What is this specific thing referencing here that makes it different from these? Yeah, it's an image, right? It's an image that's going to be stored inside of our public folder, right? It's an image that's stored on the client side. So it's never, it's never going up to our server to get this information. It's stored on the client side in our public folder, or it will be once I put it in there. <laughs> and, uh, and so, yeah, this is different. This is not, this is not something that's going up to this, up to the server like this. This is just looking in the public folder for a specific file, exactly. Yep. It's using a source and then it's looking in the public folder. Right. Exactly. So these look similar, but they are very different in what they're doing. So I just wanted to be very clear on what was happening there. Okay, good. 
good understanding there. Okay, so we've got, obviously we have a route that's called login. Cool. Seeing that. Um, oh, here's another route. Menu slash new. So already I'm seeing something where we're probably gonna need something in the server.js for maybe login and something else for maybe menu. Okay. Uh, let's look at index.ejs and see if we see any more. Okay, here's one for slash Q. So we could always have like a catch all that has just like the slash and it just sends everything to, you know, that it, that it can't handle to a, um, you know, a single router but for, with just a slash. So that might be what we do for this. Um, here's another route that starts with menu, menu. So I'm thinking we're gonna ha definitely have a menu router and then maybe a login router. So a menu router that can handle everything related to like updating menus, maybe adding menus, deleting menus, all the CRUD operations related to menus that we're gonna be, you know, adding and modifying. So maybe we have a router for menus um, and then we have a router for all of the like login, log out actions. And then maybe we have a, another router for everything else. <laughs> yeah, and we could have specific like 404 and 500 routes as well. Um, optional. Um, they aren't currently in this app, but that is something you could add. You could add specific routes for, for specific error pages. Um, yeah, the, right now, the way that this is set up is that um, there is a specific error page, error.ejs over here on the left. Um, and that essentially grabs what it's getting back um, very specific and, you know, just puts it on the page for you. So I actually saw that a couple times when I was building this. It was very helpful. <laughs> but yeah, you could have specific user facing error pages too, like that, you know, are more reader friendly. Uh, okay, so I'm thinking, I'm thinking menu, I'm thinking login, a login route for all the authentication stuff, and then maybe a just a, a root route for um, everything else. Cool. But let's make sure that we're not missing anything else here. So again, on our login page, all right, slash login, slash login. Yeah, and then on the new account page, again, we see slash login and slash login. So I think that sounds good. Uh, Mel Mel, are you, are you getting an, are you trying to run this code already? Are you trying to run the completed code? Cause yeah, Mongo errors can be caused by a variety of things, but, um, how can we set up Morgan to use it in the project? Oh, it's very easy. You can just, um, install it first, install Morgan. Um, and then just make sure that you require it in your server.js file. So just require it and then um, make sure that you use it. So app.use. Just app.use and then that should be enough to get it running. You can configure it in a lot of different ways, but um, we're just using it with you know pretty basic configuration. Uh, Nubish says, did you create this code from scratch or do we copy and paste? Well, a lot of it is copy and paste from Leon's code. This whole server.js that we just went through, this is based on Leon's MVC auth, like copied and pasted directly from Leon's MVC auth repo. And like I said, there's nothing wrong with that. A lot of times what you're going to be doing as a, as a real life developer is copying and pasting chunks of code to do what you want. Uh, Mel Mel on the full stack credit app video. Um, the full stack crud app video. Uh, so yeah, just check. I would say the most common problems with MongoDB there, Mel Mel, are um, password. You have the wrong password or there's something else wrong with your connection string. Um, I guess I would need to know more about the error um, in order to help you. But um, yeah, the, check your connection string. Make sure that's right. Um, check your password too. Oh, we got the hydrate. All right. Thank you. I needed I needed a hydrate. My voice was getting a little scratchy there. <clears throat> Twism says, uh, OMG, it looks like I missed a lot. No, you can still catch up. Um, I've got a link to the finished repo right here if you want to look at it. 
Boop, boop, boop. Yeah, and you can always catch the VOD too. All my VODs are available for for 60 days uh, and then they go to my YouTube channel where they're available forever. Um, so exclamation point YouTube, if you want to follow me on YouTube as well, that's where all my videos go. Exclamation point Twitter, if you want my Twitter. Uh, Twins, Twism says, I'm attending an online boot camp for a full stack and I can't wait to start applying. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, if you ever want guidance on applying for jobs, that's free. Um, so, you, you know, I know boot camps may not always be the most supportive when you get to the end stage. Um, you could always follow along with 100 devs. We're in the job hunt process right now. 100 devs is free. You don't got to pay anything. There's no obligation. There's no limitations. Um, so if you want a little extra resources for applying for jobs, um, just type exclamation point Leon in the chat. Um, and you can see our Discord. You can see our Twitch um, and all that good stuff and get some help with applying. Yeah. Because the whole class is focused on applying for jobs right now. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Uh, so somebody asked, did we copy and paste the um, EJS files? Yes, we did. Um, mostly just because I didn't want to type them out from scratch. I didn't think it was worthwhile. What we did instead is we copied and pasted them from the finished repo, from, from my repo that I just shared. Um, we copied and pasted them. And then we just kind of walked through them to see what they were doing. Yeah. Because there's a lot of room for error when you're, when you're using EJS. <laughs> Welcome, Riyad. <laughs> okay, so we just finished with our server.js and now let's go ahead and add some routes. So like I mentioned, as we went through our um, views here, we kind of saw that we, it seems like things are kind of broken out into three, um, uh, three different types of routes. Oh, thank you so much. The, uh, the it of Allen. Welcome. Thank you for the raid. I appreciate it. <laughs> what were you working on, Alan? What were you building? Howdy. <laughs> Welcome. We are today, we are building a full stack app, um, that allows you to add restaurant menus or allows me to add restaurant menus. This is mostly for me. Uh, allows you to add restaurant menus, got some authentication here, um, adding local menus, do CRUD operations, edit, delete, view the menus, and also do some search too. So we can search and just get back the results that we want from our database. We're using MongoDB as our backend, um, JavaScript for the code and EJS for the template. Today was fighting with cloud formation. Wow, cloud stuff is really cool. <laughs> welcome, welcome. Okay. And uh, by the way, I should introduce myself. We got a lot of new folks here today. Um, my name is Mine Wolf. I am actually a SQL developer. Uh, my day job is uh, as a senior SQL developer uh, for a university, um, but I am learning web development in my free time. Uh, and so that's what we practice on stream here. Occasionally I do talk about SQL. Um, but we mostly focus on web development because it's fun. All right, thank you everybody for coming today. All right, thank you, Frazy. <laughs> Google just bought this off you for 5 million? <laughs> really? <laughs> I mean, congratulations if that's true. <laughs> I choose to believe you. How about API? Why did we stop using API? Well, a lot of what we've been building is full stack apps, right? So we're integrating the client side with the server side, right? And so APIs are really just like the server side half of that. And so we've just, all we've done is we've just added to that basic concept of APIs, right? We were, now we're just adding the front end as well. Um, so there's nothing wrong with you still building APIs for people to hit and, and get information from. A lot of folks do that. Um, and you could build also, you could build the API first and then build a client side app to go with it and have them be two separate things. So you could have multiple apps that are hitting the same, you know, multiple client side projects that are hitting the same API. Um, so that's, it's just a different way of thinking about it, right? We're just, we're just more full stack now. Um, and so, you know, if you look back at my, um, I did a field guide to aliens, Star Trek field guide to aliens a little while back. Um, and for that, we built both sides of the coin. We built, we built the API first, and then we built the client side application. 
but they still but they work together they're just two separate implementations drop one case subs and true yeah yes please no <laughs> okay so let's build our routes three routes app dot use and the first one is just going to be what for whatever hits the root and doesn't fit into any of the other buckets that we're going to build so we're going to call that just the index router you could call this whatever makes sense to you um, but we're going to call it index router um then we're going to do app dot use the next one is going to be for menu specific stuff so like the crud operations that we're going to be doing on the menus that we upload so menu menu router and then app dot use um, login. This is going to be for our authentication stuff, and we're going to call that our login router. Okay. So these are going to point to three different routers. Perfect. Save that. Now I actually need to create those routers and then require them inside my um, server.js up here. So in order for my server to make use of these and, and route things accordingly, I need to require them up here and actually create the files. Okay. So I'm gonna go ahead and create another folder and I'm gonna put it um, just here at the root and it's just gonna be called uh, routes. So new folder called routes. And inside of there, I'm going to put essentially the three routers that I want to build. So call the first one index.ejs, um, not, e not ejs, sorry, <laughs> uh, rename index.js. Next one is going to be uh, menu.js. And then the third one is just going to be called, let's see, what, do I, what did I call it? I'm just going to call it login.js. You can call it auth.js too if you wanted to. Um, but yeah, that's what we're going to call that. <laughs> All right, now, now that I have these in place, I can require them in my server.js. So we're back in server.js and we're just going to require all three routes so that our server knows where they are and where to send that data. So up here at the top, I'm just going to say const index router and just require. And I can put, all I need to do is put the file location. Um, so I'm going to put a dot and then a slash routes index. Now, quick quiz. What is, why do, why did I put that dot there? What is the dot for? What does the dot do for us? Uh -huh. Yeah it goes up one level inside of our directory. Now, why did I do that? Um, well, because what I wanted to do was go up to the root and then back down into the routes, routes folder and then into the index.js. Yeah, that's true. So two dots. Yeah, two. So two dots is actually going up. I, I usually I guess the way the mental picture that I have is that I'm going up to the root and then down into the folder. But yeah, you're right. Technically, the two dots is what when you're actually going up a level if you're inside of a folder. Yeah. Right. So yeah, my mental picture is just a little skewed. <laughs> Thank you for the correction. Yeah, so we're at, we're at that level. We're at the root right now. We're not going up. We're, we're at the root right now. We go into our routes folder and then we find our index.js file. I don't need to put index.js there. It knows what it is and can find it. So let's require our other two. All right, routes. And we're going to call this one menu router. 
and then this one login router i think that's what i called them all right routes menu and routes login perfect let's double check that that's correct i think it's probably fine index menu and login perfect index menu login perfect okay so our routes are set up now what we can do is we can um, go into each of these routers and set them up so that they're going to be able to hit the appropriate controllers Uh, Maddie says, so menu tracker as in logging what you eat? No. So it's actually a way to um, aggregate all the menus from the local restaurants that I like to go to um, in one place so that I just have a, I have a list um, and I can just, you know, see the logo. And, you know, if, if I'm out, you know, driving around trying to decide what I want to eat, instead of having to Google each menu on my phone, um, I can just go to the list of restaurants. Yeah, I can even search for a restaurant if I want. I can search for it get it back, click, immediately see the menu so I don't have to Google everywhere. That's the goal. <laughs> yeah, it's, an, it's a nice idea, I like it. Um, and I got it from a, I actually got the idea from a, from a YouTuber. Um, and so I'll, I'll make sure to link them again at the end of the stream. I'll make sure I, I link them again because I want to give them appropriate credit, so. Are you pulling in the menu data from PDFs? No, I'm literally just linking the URL. So you just tap it and it goes to the to the menu URL because a lot of these places, especially the smaller ones, their menus change a lot. So um, I don't necessarily want to link static PDFs because um, I feel like that could mean that you know, you're out of date. Especially now with so many shortages of ingredients and things. Yeah. Um, if server and the routes folder are both at the same level, um, why add the slash instead of referring to routes login? Um, I mean, I was just following the, the standard that's already been set here by the other things on the list. Um, I haven't tried it without, so it might work fine without. I once converted all my receipts from PDF to JSON to do some analysis on my food shopping. That's awesome. Yeah, there's somebody in 100 devs who is like taking paint swatches. So like, you know, the, like the, the, pan, uh, what is it called? Um, Pantone, um, like paint swatches and, and those types of like catalogs of paint swatches that are like printed and they are coding them in, like, like you say, as JSON, um, like manually mostly because they're printed swatches, um, coding them in, you know, finding the appropriate like color codes and everything and creating a massive database of paint swatches. It's, it's a, it's an awesome project. I love it. A lot of work though. <laughs> I mean, I think it's really just for personal use. I don't think it's for, you know, I don't think they're like selling this data or anything. <laughs> And I don't know if it was Pantone either. I just said Pantone because I know that name. <laughs> but it's color swatches from something. I don't know about art. <laughs> yeah, and so, you know, there could be there could be a, a, a way to, like, you know, ask, if, if, yeah, if restaurants had APIs, that would be awesome to be able to hit them. Um, in my case, I'm really just thinking about, like, restaurants that, that I like. <laughs> So putting them in manually, but yeah, folks have suggested like scraping or things like that. Yeah. So if you were trying to make like an exhaustive database of local restaurants in a particular area, um, yeah, that would be cool if you could just like scrape all their sites at once and dump them in. Yeah. Just create your own APIs. That's right. Tech too. <laughs> okay. So now we've required our routes. So this, so our server knows where to find them and it also knows where to send the data that it's receiving. So let's go ahead and go into our routes files and start building them out. Okay, so inside of our routes, this is where we're actually doing kind of the fine tuning and we're, we're this is the last mile. We're, we're taking that data that comes from the server and our router here is 
going to be sending it to a very specific controller inside of one of our controller files. So a very specific method inside of one of our controller files is going to be handling the data that it receives. Um, oh, it's about time for a break, isn't it? Okay, let's do this. Let's do one router. And then um, when we come back, we'll do the rest of the routers and then we'll do the controllers. So in order to set up our router here, I'm going to need to require a few things. I'm going to require express. Actually, why am I typing this out? I'm not going to type this out. I'm going to copy and paste all the requirements from Leon's code. Why, why am I typing things? We don't need to type things. I'm going to head over to the MVC auth, 100 devs MVC auth repo, where we've been getting things so far. I'm going to pop into the routes folder. And I'm just going to pick one. It doesn't really matter. Um, routes, just pick this one. And I'm just going to grab all of the um, all of the requirements here, all of the consts. I'm going to require. I'm going to grab those. Actually, I'm just going to grab the whole thing and take out what we don't need. So grab all of that, pop it in. Oops, grab too much. And then I'm going to take out the existing routes. And what I'm left with is, um, you know, we have all of our requirements here. Um, we're going to have. We're going to be adding some controllers up top. So I'm going to take out these existing ones, add controllers, all right, and then add routes here. MME says, I just tested it. It really has to be dot routes slash file name. If I remove the, the, the dot slash, the app crashes. Thank you for, thank you for taking one for the team there, MME. <laughs> Tech2 says, if only we knew an Oracle DBMA. <laughs> I'm, I'm actually not a database administrator. Um, I'm a developer. So yeah, I'm not a DBA. I'm not a DBA, to be clear. Uh, just a developer. I don't know that I will. I don't know that I would want to be a database administrator. That seems like a really hard job. I prefer to just, you know, ask, ask the DBAs for things. <laughs> Well, somebody was saying, uh, Maddie Two Shoes, somebody was saying earlier that they just use Uber Eats to like look up restaurant menus, like in Uber Eats, and then they don't order anything. And then they just go to the restaurant and get their food, which I think is a wonderful thing to do. Control A, then C, fingers hurt. Oh, tech two. You're going to have to limber up those, those control A, control C, control V fingers, my friend. You, you got to build the, build the muscles. You're going to need them. <laughs> no worries, Maddie. Get your beauty sleep, my friend. <laughs> uh, Rob Robert says in the to do's.js route, well, we're not going to be using, so we're not going to be using to do's.js. Um, so over here, the, the routes that I have are just index.js, login.js, and menu.js. Um, we're just going to be using, these are the ones we're going to be using for this app. Uh, yeah, I'm not quite sure what you're going for there, uh, Rav Robert, but maybe just follow along for how we build this one. Um, and cause yeah, I'm not quite sure what you're asking there. Um, cause we're not going to be using anything with like to do's. Um, this is, this is the, this is for the, the menu app. So anything that's to do related, we just need to, to, to delete that out of there. Okay. So we have some middleware here. I'm going to comment that out for now. We're not going to use it at the moment. I might put that back later, but I'm going to comment out the middleware. Um, and then I'm going to add my routers that I want to add to, uh, sorry, I'm going to add my um, routers that are going to point to specific controllers. So in here, this is kind of my catch-all. Um, so in here, I think really I'm only going to put two things, router.get. I'm going to handle the request for the home page because that's what happens when, you know, just the thing that happens when the user visits the homepage for the first time, right? Like you open localhost 8000 or localhost 8500 or whatever. Um, that'll be our first route. So we're just going to drop that in. That's just the slash. 
And so I'm going to just have a controller with a similar name, just called index controller. And inside of that index controller, I'm going to have a method that's going to handle just getting the home page. Because what I want to happen when I when somebody goes to the slash is I want to get the home page. So my method is just going to be called get home. Fairly straightforward. All right, and then my next one is going to be a little bit different. Actually, let's well let's just let's just do this one for now. We're just going to do one. Just get home for now. When they visit the slash, get the home page. Cool. We're going to have a controller that's going to handle that. Um, and now let's go ahead and um, well let's go ahead and take a break. And what we're going to do when we get back is we'll go ahead and add our login and our menu routes. And then we're going to have one more special route that we're going to add in this um, particular router here. Because I think it is break time. Yes, it is. OK, break time, five minutes, working through the routes, and then we'll do the controllers. Yulu says, what do you mean menu tracking? Yeah, so when I mean menu, I literally mean like restaurant menus, <laughs> not, like, uh, not like navigation menus. Um, so I'm just this is just a simple app um, that has restaurants that I like. Um, you can add restaurants. You can add new menus like this. Um, you can um, see the full list. You can edit. You can delete. And then you can click on these and actually see the menu for the place. Right? Yeah, so that's all we're doing there. No, you're good, Yulu. No worries. Yeah, the word menu can mean a lot of things, right? <laughs> yeah, it's not the prettiest logo, right? It's the it's the finest logo that a free that a free logo generator online could uh, could generate for me. So, very high quality. Okay, five minutes. I'll see you back here very soon.
Okay, folks, we had about 45 seconds left in the break. We're gonna slam through the rest of this bad boy. Get it up and running. No worries, Hurt. See you soon. <laughs> Go grab dinner, sure. All right, let's go ahead and stop the timer. Finally having breakfast at 2.16. I know that feeling serious. It happens to me sometimes too. Sometimes the day just gets away from you and you realize you haven't eaten anything <laughs> and it's afternoon. <laughs> okay, so here's our first router and I'm gonna go ahead and just grab this. So we just did our index.js. I'm just gonna grab this and drop it into the other two. And we're just gonna modify this with the appropriate routes for the other two. So um, get that. And all right, let's go to login.js. And um, we're gonna need to add our controllers in there. So after we're after we've uh, you know put together the controllers, we'll, we'll need to make sure we add them into each of our routers. Um, <clears throat> but in here, I'm gonna have need to have multiple routes. Um, so one of them is going to be, probably the first one that we're gonna do is just the route that's going to get the login page. So if a, if a user clicks on the login page, you know, saying, I want to log in, we will need a route that's going to get that login page. Now, how do I know what route that needs to be? Um, I can look at, I can look at my um, index page. I think that's where it is. <laughs> I can look at my index page and find the route that's already there. Actually, I know. Actually, I think it's in the header, but we'll we'll see. And let's look in the header here. Yeah, it's right here. Okay, so the route for login that's already there is just slash login. Okay. And if you recall, inside of our server.js, we have a path that's listening for slash login, right? So slash login comes in right here. Our server is listening for it and it goes to the login router. Oh, there's a really loud sound outside. <laughs> okay, so it goes to the login router. It's listening for slash login, goes to the login router. Um, now, once it gets to the router, for just the, for just the path of slash login, what route should I be? What should I? What should the router be listening for in order to route this to a specific controller? So inside of the router, if if my path is just slash login, server is listening for slash login. What should my router be listening for? Everybody's loving the emotes. <laughs> I'm glad. Yeah, exactly, Nacho Cal. Exactly. Our router, if our path is slash login, our server is listening for slash login, then once it gets to the router, all that's left is just the slash. So yeah, our, our router is just gonna be listening for slash to get the login page. That's a little, that can be a little hard, bit hard to um, wrap your brain around, which is why I asked. So we're going to just have a login controller. And we'll have a method that's called just get login. Okay. So now when, the, when, when, when a link is clicked that just has a path of slash login, our server is listening for slash login, it routes it to the login router. And then by the time it gets there, all that's left is just the slash. Okay, perfect. So, um, without knowing the all the like the the specific paths that we need, if we're thinking about authentication, what are some other routes? Uh, what are some other uh, you know routes that we might potentially need here in our router for things that are going to be routed to specific controllers? So, so what other actions? What other login actions might we have related to authentication? Just in general, 
what what are some other things that that are related to to logging in or or performing login log out actions on a website yeah log out that's another one sign up is another one yeah absolutely Forgot password. I actually don't have a forgot password link yet, but that's a great idea. That'll be something I'll need to add. Um, yeah, great point. Um, definitely a valid answer. Uh, what is, uh, if I, if somebody wants to sign up, what, what do we have to do first before somebody, you know, um, actually submits like sign up information? What would we have to do for them? Show a view. Yeah, exactly. We're going to have to show them the sign up page first, right? So here we have the getting the login page. And then let's also add something for getting the sign up page to render that as well. So this path is just going to be called new account. Yeah, we'll need, they'll need a, a way to sign up, right? Uh, and we'll just have a, a, a controller or a method called um, sign up, get sign up. Okay, so login, get the login page, get the sign up page. Um, like you said before, we're going to need some kind of a logout as well. So for the logout actions, it's going to do something. So logout, get log out. Okay, login, sign up, log out. Um, and these are all get requests so far, right? Because we're, we're for these, we're, 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 we're going and we're getting, we're fetching a page and to, to render it for the user, right? We're rendering a page for the user. However, if I am a user who is submitting login or sign up information, what type of request might that be? If I am submitting my login or sign up information, Yeah, it's a post request, right? Yeah, we're going to need to be listening for post requests also. Yep, welcome to Zero. Coming in with the right answer. Nice job. <laughs> okay, so we're going to have a couple of post requests as well. Router.post. Oop, spell it right. Post. Um, and for the post login, this is just going to be the slash. Um, and if you want to, you know, know how I'm, where I'm pulling this out of, I'm really, this is just getting it, going back to the, to the views and looking what paths are already there. Um, I would do that, but I'm trying to move just a titch faster. Um, so where I'm getting these paths from is just looking at the paths that are already in the views that we copied before. Uh, and then we have router.post again, and for uh, submitting new information, that's the path for that is just going to be slash new. And that's just going to be login controller post sign up. Okay. And all of these routes are going to equate to various methods that are going to be inside of our controllers. So single controller with multiple methods performing different logic. Cool. Okay, so that's login. Now let's go ahead and do our menu actions, our CRUD actions for our menu. So for our menu, again, if we want to retrieve, um, essentially, if we want to retrieve the page with our the with our menu options on it, uh, we're just going to have a get request to the home and it's going to go into our menu controller and it's going to get index. Uh, and then for our edit, let's, let's, let's really quickly, let's look at what happens when we edit, when we want to edit a menu item. So if I am trying to edit a menu item, um, and I want to basically, if I if I click on a certain um, menu item and I then I click the edit button, 
what information do you think our controller is going to need in order to tell the database that it wants to edit one specific menu item and not any of the other ones. So what 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 data do you think our router is going to be, need to be listening for in order to pass that information into the controller? What what data is required? An ID. Yeah, exactly. The ID, the specific ID of the database item, right? So our router is going to need to be listening for that specific ID so that it can pass it into the method. So it's going to be listening for that ID as a, as a parameter inside of this path here. So the colon means that this value here, this, this ID value is going to vary depending on what specific ID is passed in. So this is going to be, this, this, I, this uh, ID value may vary. It's going to, Grab, that, grab the specific method. In this case, that method is going to be edit menu. Oops, edit menu. OK. And it's going to be something very similar for, so we've done, let's see, we've done git. We've done update. What other operations might I be able to perform on these menu items? We've done git, we've done update. What are some other things that I could do? Delete, yeah, delete, that's another one. What's the, what's the last one? Yeah, we've done, we said delete. We've done read, we've done update. Yeah, exactly, the last one is create, okay. So let's go ahead and add those routes for the other for the other CRUD operations. Set, yeah, or so, I, yep, set is another one. Um, so essentially I think that's like, um, we're kind of like creating that way, yeah. Post, yep. Yeah. Different words for similar things. Get, uh, for the delete, we're just gonna say delete and then the specific ID again. So we're passing in, a value that may vary depending on the ID that we click on. Um, and for this one, it's going to be menu controller, delete menu. Okay. Um, and then we're going to have our create. So for our create option, um, what type of request should I be listening for there? What if I just want to, yeah, so so um, if I just want to get the menu, if I just want to see the menu, well, wouldn't it be get slash ID? Well, that would be if you want to see one, right? But it, but in our app, we want to see all of the menu items. So we're not, so for this one here, we're not passing in a specific ID just because we want to see all of them. But if you wanted to see a specific one and you had a controller set up to handle that, um, you could you could do that as well. Yeah, so, so our, our next one is going to be a post. Why aren't we using um, put and delete? Uh, because it still works and we didn't. <laughs> but yeah, you could be more specific. And I think there may be something in the controller that um, it, doing multiple operations, but I don't remember, to be honest. <laughs> Okay, so we're gonna have a couple post requests here. All right, the first one is gonna be for just saving um, a new menu item. These are gonna these are gonna look very similar, but they're gonna have slightly different um, outcomes. So menu controller, save menu, and then our next one is just going to be new menu controller, new menu. Okay, 
and we'll export all those. So all, those are all the routes that we need for menu operations, for login, logout, and then index.js, there's one thing that we're missing. Doesn't save me the ID too? Well, okay, that's an interesting question. So if we are saving, so if we're creating a new menu, right? If we're creating a new menu, the user, me or whoever, is typing restaurant information into a form and clicking submit, right? There, you're typing information into a form and clicking submit. Does that data have a database ID? The data that I have typed into a form and clicked submit. Does it have an ID? that I have just put in on the client side. New data. New data, raw, fresh text, just coming in, fresh off the client side. No, yeah, it doesn't have an ID yet. Yeah, because the database gives it an ID and it hasn't made it to the database yet. Exactly. Yeah, it's still it's still getting there. Yep. Right. So that's why we aren't passing in an ID. You're okay, Aquitas. You're fine. We have a repo. You can look at that um, and you know and see the finished product if you want. Okay, so these are all of our routes here. Um, and then we need one more route inside of our index.js and it's kind of a it's kind of an outlier. So we have our home page that we get. Um, and then there's one more function that we haven't really accounted for inside of the finished app. Um, so we've handled like adding new menus. We've handled um, log in, log out, right? Um, We've handled, you know, edit, we've handled delete, um, all this stuff. But what's the one thing on this page that we haven't handled yet? Anybody spot it? It's the one component on this page that we have not handled yet. Oh, and here's another thing I gotta fix. That's not uh, routing back to the home page when I clear the search. Interesting. We handled off, we, we're, we've, we've routed all of our off actions. We've handled log in, log out. We've handled adding a new menu. We've handled the edit, delete routes, all this stuff. Yeah, Nacho Cow got it. <laughs> Nacho Cow got it. It's the search. Yeah, we haven't routed. If somebody types in a search query, we haven't routed that yet. Yep, that's the outlier. So we're just going to dump that inside of our index routes. Um, so just router dot get, I think, was that get? Let me double check. Oh, sorry, it's a post. And we're gonna handle our query there. Oh, and you know what, to answer the earlier question, as far as why don't we use um, like the, uh, the other, routes like delete and put that's because a lot of this stuff is coming that's right i forgot a lot of this stuff is coming from forms not not in all cases but a lot of this stuff is coming from forms and forms can't handle anything other than um get and post right they're very limited in what they can handle um so i believe i haven't checked in all cases but that may be why that you know some of the other operations, the other CRUD operations aren't being handled there or aren't being sent because a lot of this data is coming from forms and forms are limited. They're great, but they are limited in some cases. Okay. So we have our search here. Search is going to be passed in as a slash Q for query. Um, index controller dot get search. And in this case, that's what's happening is we're using a form to send this request. So it has to be a post. Um, it can only be a get or, or a post. And in this case, we're just sending it as a post. In the end, the database action, the logic in the controller is really what's going to control, is really what's going to determine 
what actually happens, right? So we can we can do a request against the database for whatever we want, um, regardless of the type of route that gets sent. Yeah, we, we're using gets in some cases because we are asking for the views, but we're also going to be performing um, deletes and edits as well. Feature Suite says, will you be indexing your schema for the search? Um, no, I'm not going to index it. It's not going to be that, it's never going to be that large. Um, if I, if it was like, you know, a few thousand things, I would probably need to index it, um, but not in this case. Oh, thank you for the stretch. But yeah, indexing can be good when you start to get into really large databases. Uh, Tame, just because it's, it's just coming in from a form. We're not adding, no, we're not adding anything. Oh, thank you for the hydrate. Where's my tea? Ah, I left it over there on the um, on the table. <laughs> yeah, exactly. MME says, I do find it hard to remember to write either get or post in the router, even though what I really want to do is update or delete. Yeah. And we are sending data. That's true, because the query is sending data into the controller to look for something. So it's, but it is a form, so we are limited on what type of request we can use. Yeah, let me get my tea really quickly. And that that uh, that poll that you see uh, that you see behind me there that's actually I'm I'm working on setting up a blue uh, green screen um, for a background. I don't actually have the fabric yet, but I do have the stand, so that's what that is. Yeah, pretty soon I'll be chroma keyed. It'll be cool, but not yet. Got to buy the fabric. Okay, thank you for the hydrate. So we've got our routes. Um, nice time to stream from the hundred devization scene. <laughs> Thought that was part of a cat tree. That is a reasonable guess. I gotta say, <laughs> always a reasonable guess. But no, it's just a it's a stand for a blue screen. Um, okay, or green screen, whatever. All right, so we've got our router set up and really like, but most of the logic is going to be handled via our controllers, right? The routes, the routes are really just telling it where to go, what methods to get in the controller. And then, um, then we're going to uh, handle the logic in the controllers themselves. All right, so let's go ahead and build our controllers now. So for our controllers, we're going to have three that are going to kind of mirror our routes. So we'll have an index controller, a login controller, and a menu controller. Let's go ahead and add another folder. Controllers. All right. And in there, I'm going to go ahead and put index.js. And you don't have to, like, I, I know I'm reusing, um, you know, file names here. You don't have to do that. You could name them distinctly if you want. Um, I do have a setting turned on in VS Code that tells me what exactly folder I'm in for every single file. You can see here, it's showing me my folders. Um, so that's up to you how you want to do it. Login.js and uh, menu.js. Okay. Got those files. And now our controllers, again, are going to be where we're actually handling the logic for all of our requests. Mind Wolf in Space coming soon. Yeah, I'm going to have, I'll, I'm actually probably going to do it Leon style where I just cut myself out of the background, right? And just have more real estate for what's on the screen. But yeah, some cool backgrounds would be fun. Yeah, and I'm sure, like Piece of Shoot says, I'm sure there's best practices for, you know, um, for how you handle your routes and that kind of thing. I, I tend to play kind of fast and loose with it, um, but, you know, then handle the logic on the, on the controller side. But yeah, I'm sure there's best practices. <laughs> that got dark fast there, Tech2. <laughs> Okay, so we've created our files now. In our um, in our routes, 
the last, now that we have our files in the correct folder, we're going to need to require them in our routes. Ooh, just another grats. Holy cannoli. Thank you so much for the gifted subs. Wow. 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 If you just got a gifted sub from just another grats, please thank them in the comments and show off your new emojis that you're, or your new emotes that you're now allowed to use since you're a subscriber. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no worries, Gratz. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, flex those new emotes. Okay, so we do need to make sure that we require our, um, our, our controllers now that we have them. Um, so inside of our routes, let's just do that. So we have our index controller, so const index controller. We just require it and we're going to require folders index or controllers index. And here we're using the two dots because we're going up one folder. So from routes, we're going up and then back down into the controllers folder. All right. Index controller is set. And then for the login, oops, for the login routes, const uh, login controller. We're going to require controllers slash login. Okay. And then for menu, oops, for menu, we're going to go ahead and add, oops, all right. All right. For that, we're going to go ahead and add menu controller. Controller slash menu. Perfect. Okay. So now that we've required them, our router knows where that file is. So it knows where to get the method. <laughs> Chat's wilding out. <laughs> oh, thank you, Chris. <laughs> They are very cute, aren't they? <laughs> yeah, I love them. I found them on Etsy. Um, you know, a creator there um, was had was making green wolf emotes, and I was like, "Yes, please, give them to me." <laughs> so, yeah, I love supporting uh, you know artists and creators uh, on Etsy. So I was able to do that. It worked out really well. Okay. So we've, we've referenced that now our routers are hooked up to our controllers. And so when they receive a request, they can just grab the appropriate method and execute it. Okay. Inside of our controllers, now we can actually start putting together the logic for our application. So inside of our controllers, I'm going to be making use of so, so, okay, out of all of the MVC elements, um, we know that models talk to the database, right? So models are really the only thing that can talk directly to the database. Um, what is the element that talks to the models? If you're, if you're thinking about MVC, what is the, what is the MVC element that talks to the model? Yeah, so the controllers talk to the model. So what I'm going to be, need to be doing in these controller files is making sure that I'm able to talk to my models by requiring them, right? I'm going to need to be able to, so that my, so that my controllers know where my models are in the scheme of things, um, I'm going to need to make sure that I require them in all of my controller files. And that's easy to forget is that, you know, you're just like, I'm building out my logic. And then you forget to actually tell your controller where the model is. So in this case, I'm going to go ahead and require it, but I'm going to set it up as a variable called schemas. And we'll get into that in just a minute. 
um, I'm just going to set a single variable called schemas because I'm going to have more than one. Um, and I'm going to require a folder, which I'm going to create here in just a second. So I'm going to create a folder called models slash schemas. And that's where I'm going to go ahead and drop all of my schemas. And I think this is kind of neat the way that this code does this, um, is that there's multiple schemas in one file, but that doesn't mean that you can't pull them out individually. So we're gonna have a couple schemas in one file and we're gonna still be able to point to the individual, um, the individual uh, model that we want inside of that file. I just think it's a kind of a cool way to do it. So since it's cool, we're gonna do it. Uh, in the controller, in the controller, can we give logic rules or is it on service? I assume you're asking about where does the logic happen? Um, so the logic is supposed to happen in the controllers. Yeah, the server is more like a hub where things, where, where, where data goes to where it needs to go. Um, inside of our controllers, that's the brain of the application. So that's where our logic is going to be. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and drop that in there. And I'm just gonna go ahead and require that in all of my controllers, just so we don't forget. All right, so I've required my schema. Now let's go ahead and set up our schema folder. Now, what is a schema? So I'm gonna have a, whoops. Here at the root, I'm going to set up a models folder. And inside there, I'm going to put a file called uh, schema dot, or schemas, sorry, schemas.js. Yeah, it's a blueprint for our data, right? It's a blueprint for the data that we're writing to and from our database. Exactly. Yeah. And so our model references the schemas in order to build the data that we're sending to the database. Exactly. Rules and regulations, yeah. <laughs> no worries, multi-hyphenate. Yeah, feel free to catch the VOD. Okay, so let's build out our schemas so that we can reference them in our controllers. So we have a blueprint for our data. Okay, so what, um, what tool that I already have, what, what, what tool is able to use the schemas to talk to the database? Specifically, what, what tool do we use to do that? What tool that I've installed allows us to talk to the database and use schemas in order to do that? Yeah, it's Mongoose, exactly. So we're gonna to need to go ahead and require Mongoose. Require uh, Mongoose, perfect. And building a schema is fairly simple. Um, I'm gonna have two schemas. What two schemas, just taking a, a wild flying guess, what two schemas do you think, what, what, what data do you think I'm gonna to wanna to store in the, in the database? What schemas do you think I might need? Yeah, exactly. We're probably gonna need one for the users and then one for our restaurant menus. Right, exactly. So we're gonna need, probably need two separate schemas, one for the user data, and then one for the menu data. Yeah, exactly, right, spot on. So we're gonna call one menu schema, menu schema, and all we need to do is just say, hey, Mongoose, build a new schema, please. Mongoose.schema, and in here is where we actually put like the properties of the thing that we want to store inside of the database. So not gonna have too many properties here. Really, we just kind of want the, the restaurant name, right? So it's searchable. We want uh, like the image icon to show on the app. We're gonna want the actual URL of the menu itself. And then I'm also gonna add just an entry date so that we can see when it was added. So um, properties are just gonna be, we're just gonna say name, 
um, icon, menu, URL, and entry date. So those four properties. Now, the cool thing about schemas, what makes them so nice is that I can add properties for each of these items. So I can specify what type of data they should be. Um, I can specify things like um, whether or not they're required. I can specify things like, you know, the oh, lots of things. I, I, I suppose you can do things like length, type. Um, you could even have like default values where if, if this comes in as, if something comes in as blank, you can specify a default value. Um, so it's really nice. It helps keep your data nice and structured and clean um, and make sure that what you put in your database is what you want in your database. So for all of these, they're pretty much going to be similar. We're going to have them be strings, type string, and required is going to be true, right? Because each for each thing I put in my database, I want to make sure that it has all of these, you know, properties in order for it to display properly in the app. All right, so I can kind of just copy and paste things. Oops, comma, string, string, and string. And then for this last one, this is not something that the user actually enters. So I'm just gonna have this be like a default value. So I see some folks are asking some questions here. So let me see what we got here. Uh, MME says, now that we've been using schemas, I don't remember what we did with just MongoDB before Mongoose. Yeah, so with just MongoDB, we really just had to build like everything, like all the database entries just kind of manually, like by hand, like each time, you know, setting up the properties, setting the values, all that kind of thing. Um, is it okay to keep using Mongoose or are there cases where we, for some reason, should not use Mongoose? Um, I mean, I think Mongoose in most cases is just does more, um, right? It's just better. Um, I suppose if you didn't really care about how structured your data was, you could probably get by without it. But I don't know that there's a drawback to using Mongoose. I mean, I, I would let somebody who's more familiar with it maybe answer that question. Um, but I mean, I think it's pretty, pretty good all around. <laughs> Tech2 says, is the ID then auto-generated in MongoDB? Yep. Once it hits the database, it's given an ID value that is truly unique. So that's why we reference it later, because that ID value is like a true unique ID. Schemas are so clean and tidy. I love it. Yeah. As a relational database developer, as a SQL dev, uh, I, I tend to I tend to appreciate the, the structuredness of, of these schemas. Seku says, I like to use MySQL. Is that a problem? No, I, I'm a SQL developer. That's what I do. At my day job, I, I do SQL all day. So one is not better than the other. It's not a, it's not a better or worse or, or, or good or bad thing. Um, it's really just what is the right tool for the job, right? Uh, there's a property in Mongoose to create timestamps. Oh, neat. Yeah, I, 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 well, it seems like if I just do default date, um, it it adds a timestamp as well. But what's the advantage, uh, piece of shoot, what's the advantage of the, the timestamp over like just saying like this, default um, date dot now? No, <laughs> it's okay. I got what you were saying there, piece of shoot. Yeah, so for the entry date here, we're just going to put a default value of today's date. Oh, I see what you're saying. You see, okay, so it's like a, after the closing bracket. Before, oh, oh, so down here, you can timestamp it that way. I see what you're saying. Yeah, I got you. <laughs> yeah, we're going to specify it here. But yeah, you can also do timestamps down here, as Shoot said. Mm -hmm. So this is our menu schema. And now let's go ahead and do our user schema. So I'm just going to copy and paste because Control-C, Control-V is our friend. Um, we're going to call this user schema, new schema, and here we're just going to have an email, a password, oops, P 
EWD. It's abbreviated here. You don't have to abbreviate it. That's up to you. Uh, and then an entry date as well. Okay. So the schemas themselves are very simple. Um, and then all we're going to do is we're just going to export both of these schemas as a single object. So that way, all we need to do is just go into that object and grab the schema that we want every time we want to reference a schema. It's actually a, kind of a cool way to do it. So we group these schemas together in an object and export them together as a singular object and then just reference whichever one we need. So that's what we're going to do now. Oh, it will automatically update when you change any field. Okay. Uh, Renny says, doesn't the menu item need to belong to a user? Yes. Currently, that feature is not present um, in this app because we aren't using like the middleware that's going to be passing that user ID, that's going to be storing that user ID and passing it back and forth. Um, however, that is an, a planned improvement that I have for the app very soon. Um, it's just not implemented yet. Um, but yes, I completely agree. The, the, the individual items should, should be tied to a particular user. Um, that's in phase two. <laughs> Use node for some small projects. Uh, you had a, you had no idea what is the best way to organize project in Node.js, for example, controller or model. Is there any best advice? Yeah, I mean, MVC structure in general is what we're using here. Um, and it's a pretty good way to organize things. Um, you know, model view controller, right? And so um, you can you know, put all your views in one location, um, put your routes together, and then have all the, the, the application logic taking place inside of the controllers. Um, and then your models, you know, are in their own location as well. Is there a way to restrict who can create users? Um, I suppose you could have like an admin role, you could have like a, you could have a separate role function. Um, that would only allow admin users to access the create user menu. Um, you could probably do that. You would you, have to add some kind of elevation, right? You'd have to add like regular users and then admins. The guessing best practice would be to separate the schemas out to individual files. I mean, that's what we usually do. I just thought this was kind of a cool way to do it because these schemas are so small that like, I mean, we can, we can um, export them together as a single object and then just reference whichever one we need, which I think is kind of neat. I don't know which one is better, but I thought this, this was different and kind of interesting. So we're gonna do this this time. All right, so our menu, we're just gonna declare a var variable here and we're gonna set that equal to our our, our model essentially, right? So each time we want to create a new model to reference a schema, we just say mongoose.model. This is the name of the model menu. We're associating it with the menu schema. And this third argument is optional, but what it does is it references the specific collection that you want to create in your MongoDB database, right? So we have the name of our model here, the schema it's associated with, which is here, and then the name of the collection that we want to talk to, which is here. All right, and then I'm gonna go ahead and create another variable for users. Users, mongoose model, it's gonna reference, it's gonna be, uh, model's gonna be called users. We're gonna reference the user schema and going to hit the uh, user's collection. And now I'm going to essentially export the both of these schemas together as a single object. So in order to do that, I can just say let my schemas and group both of these together as an object. Let me format this a little bit. There we go my schemas, sorry, okay, there. Um, 
first one is just going to be called menu and have the menu model in it menu and users okay and so all we've done here is just grouped both schemas or both models sorry both models together this is this should really be called um my models but um group both both models together inside of a single object and now we can export that object as just one singular thing module.exports my schemas there so now we can reference it in our controllers as a single object and then just call out which schema we want to reference Yeah, exactly. It may not be a better approach, but it is different. And so it's nice to see different things. Yeah, and that's a great, uh, that's another great option, Nacho Call, for the, for the question earlier about um, controlling who can create new users. Um, you could also create middleware that then checks, you know, you'd have an admin flag on your, um, on your blueprint in your database. You'd have an admin flag that says something like admin role, and then you would have some middleware, which stops everyone else from getting to those certain routes. So it just, it would redirect them back to the homepage or something like that if they tried to access it. So kind of like the ensure off um, routes that we, that Leon had in his code, you could just add like a, an ensure admin middleware or something like that. Yeah. All right, we'll export those. And then we can start doing the logic in our controllers. All right, so, um, Let's pop over to our controllers and look at index.js. And we already required our schemas, which have been exported. So now we can use them. Okay. So the, according to my routes, the things that I need to handle in my index.js are the methods I'm going to need to create are two of them, get home and get search. This one is going to deliver the home page, and this one is going to do the search results. So let's go ahead and create those inside of our controllers. So all I need to do is just say module.exports. And it's going to be able to export each of these methods um, and so we can reference them in our routers. All right, so our first one is gonna be called get home. And then our second one is gonna be called get search. All right. Get home and get search. So the first one is really just going to be rendering our index.ejs, so like rendering our, um, our home page and we're also going to need to find all of the restaurant data that we already have in our database and just display that. Um, okay, so let's do that. We're going to have an async function because we're going to be talking to the database. Since we're querying the database, we won't always want to use an asynchronous function because we want to wait for those results to come back from the database before we move on, right? Okay. And then he says, this is one of the reasons why I find streams like this particularly fun. I love seeing different approaches and tricks from different programmers, learn not just their techniques, but also how they think and solve problems. Yeah, that's awesome. That's why I really like tutorials because you kind of see the thought process of the person that built it and which might be completely different from yours, but you probably are gonna learn something new. Just like I learned about that schema thing, like combining those schemas together. Um, and the search thing that we're, that we're going to build in just a minute. I learned how to do search, which is so cool. I'd never done that, you know, in that way before. It really simplified search for me. So we're going to do that in just a second as well. This will also help if you need to rewrite something. Um, as far as like um, the structure or... Okay, so... Uh, let menu, so first thing we're going to do is we're going to retrieve the specific, we're going to retrieve the specific schema that we want to reference in this case. So if we're getting menu information, we're going to want to grab 
we're going to want to make sure that we're, we're, we're accessing the menu schema. So first thing I'm going to do is just say let menu equals schemas dot menu. Oops, schemas dot menu. Okay, now why can I do that? Why can I just say schemas dot menu and know that it's going to specifically retrieve the menu schema that I exported? Why does this notation work? Schemas dot menu. Oh, thank you, Tech2. <laughs> yeah, knowing different ways of, of, to do something can definitely help you. Yeah, VS Code knows what's up, right? <laughs> any, any guesses? Why does this notation work? Why can I just say schemas.menu and have it immediately go and specifically retrieve the menu schema? Because we imported it, yeah. We exported it as an, yes, exactly. Nacho Kyle got it, yep. We exported both schemas inside of a single object, right? And so with object notation, I can just go inside the schema's object and grab the menu item, which is associated with the menu schema. So we have both schemas stored inside of one larger object. And so I can just use object notation and go in and reference the specific one that I want. Yeah, it's dot notation, exactly, yep. Dot notation for an object. So I can just pull it right out of there, which I think is a really cool way to do it. Okay, and then the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna, we're gonna be referencing some session data here. So we haven't talked about sessions in a while, um, but, um, well, so in the, in, the, in the tutorial, they notated it as sesh, which I think is kind of funny, so that's what I'm gonna do. But uh, we're, we're also gonna need to make sure that the user's session is valid. So the session data is, is being um, uh, handled with middleware, so that it's being passed in in the request. So I can, I can retrieve session data from, directly from the request and store that in a variable. <laughs> nice, smart, yeah. <laughs> All right, so we've got our sesh and we've got our menu and that should be everything that we need in order to successfully render this home page. Okay. So first thing I want to do is I want to go up to the database and retrieve all of the restaurant data that I have stored so far. Um, so we're going to do a, um, we're just going to say let menu results and we're going to await a find menu.find. So what this is doing is it's accessing that menu schema and then it's going to go up to the database and just grab everything. Now, if I was going to modify this um, to actually be user specific, right, to, to deal with the user data, I would change this find to include the user ID so that it would only find data related to a specific user. However, in our case, we don't have that yet. So we're just going to do a find. All right. Um, and then I'm going to take that menu data and this, um, this tutorial uses a little bit of a mixture of, you know, promise and um, modern notation. So just, just roll with it. It's okay. It, it still works. <laughs> it's going to grab that menu data. JavaScript is flexible, isn't it? All right. And then we're going to pass that menu data in to our EJS render, right? We can pass, the cool thing about EJS is that we can pass data in, um, and um, you know, pass that data into the EJS, the EJS knows how to handle it, and it can just render it out. Okay, so take that menu data and then do a res.render. Render our index. And then what we're gonna do is pass that data in as various properties here. So res.render is gonna render index.ejs, and we're gonna pass in, um, we're gonna pass in various properties here. Okay, so we're gonna give it a title. Okay, and then as the data, we're just gonna pass in all of the data that we retrieve from the database. Data is gonna be menu data and 
our default value of that search bar that we built. So we have that search bar. We're gonna, we can pass in a default value for that as well. So our search bar is gonna be empty. And the last thing we're gonna do is we're gonna pass in a logged in value. Now in, the, in, the, in Leon's app, um, you know, validation of what users can and can't see is handled mostly by middleware. Um, in this particular app, since it's not using Passport, um, we're actually going to do some validation on the EJS side, which I don't think is a really great way to handle it, but it's okay. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna roll with it. So we're gonna pass in a logged in value, and there's some logic in the EJS which is going to show things or not show things based on whether the user is logged in. So if the user is not logged in, they can't see the list of restaurants. If they are logged in, then they can. Um, again, I don't think this is a great way to handle it, but that'll be an improvement that I'm going to make um, as I keep working on this app. So for now, we'll just roll with it. It's not anything, you know, it's not sensitive data or anything, so we can let it ride. All right, so we're passing in a logged in value. Um, and I need to make sure I'm closing my things here. I have a, I have a parenthesis issue somewhere, looks like. <laughs> Fine, then, oh, extra parentheses, sorry. Okay, there we go. And there we go. Hey, Sina. <laughs> now, I wish I knew COBOL, but I don't. This is just JavaScript. It's all good. <laughs> I've heard that COBOL programmers can make bank, though. I just know SQL and JavaScript. You can do some, yeah, you can do some, we're gonna do some, um, you, you can do some basic client side validation with regex, um, specifically for like the logged in value, whether or not the user is logged in. I, mean, I think you'd really wanna handle that, you know, like using Passport, um, but we don't have that right now. So that's a future a future addition. Okay, so I think this, this, this particular um, method is complete. COBOL I need for my mainframe. <laughs> so this method is complete. And the next method we're gonna do is the one that's gonna handle our search requests. So we can render the home page, we can display the restaurant data, and now we're going to handle search requests. What is that about COBOL? <laughs> COBOL is a uh, very old language, which is used in a surprising amount of places. Yeah. Actually, we are overdue for a break, aren't we? I apologize. Um, okay, let's take a break. When we get back, we'll handle our search requests um, and we'll finish out our controllers and we will test out the app. So the last, this is really it. We just need to finish building our controllers and then the app should be done and theoretically it will work, but we shall see, won't we? <laughs> yeah, I mean, so so in this case, it would probably work just fine without the then. Um, I think, you know, we don't really need that because it's just, right, it's, it's, it's waiting on this and then the only last thing it needs to do is just render. So yeah, I think you're completely right, piece of shoot. You could probably just remove that, pass in the menu data, and you would be fine. Yep, first try. <laughs> Scotty, you're, you uh, might be, a, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know if this is gonna be first try or not. We're doing an awful lot here. <laughs> hey, Seku, uh, if you want my YouTube channel, you can do exclamation point YouTube in chat for a direct link to my YouTube channel. Um, if you want to learn more about Leon and see his videos, um, you can do exclamation point Leon in chat and which will give you links to all of his stuff as well. So, um, for me here, I'll just do that for you. For me, YouTube, that's my YouTube channel. And then for Leon's things, that's all those links. There you go. Yeah, and we can we can refactor we could refactor this to be try catch and all that good stuff. It probably should be try catch. Um, you can use mixed notation. It does work. Um, you know, doing thens with a with an um, await. But yeah, I agree. The the best practice here would be to use try catch. Yep. 
and that'll be the type like i'm like i would think i'm i think i'm like 70 percent like done refactoring this but there's a lot more i need to do i wish i could have i wish i could have implemented passport um before the stream today but i like i i had it in place at one point and it was so close it was almost working but there was just a, some things that just weren't quite right and so i stripped it out and i just went back to um you know I, I refactored it to MVC. I changed a bunch of things to structurally, but I just couldn't quite get passport working. So, yeah. Yeah, and the ACE, yeah, of course, right? In this case, the then does not do anything at all. Correct. Yep. It is useless. It's wheels on a fish. Yep. <laughs> okay. I'm going to save this for now. Um, I'm going to save all of these actually. Yeah. And, and yeah, that, that's awesome that you noticed that and you know, like you understand conceptually what needs to be there, right? Look at us go. Indeed. We're so smart. Okay. Set the timer. Five minutes. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to knock this bad boy out in the next hour. That's what we're going to do. Mostly because I have to, because I have to feed my foster kittens. <laughs> They're on a schedule. So we're on a time limit. <laughs> we'll get it done though. It's all good. We're gonna, and we're going to get it right, like Scani said. Scani believes in me, so we're going to get it right on the first try. What do you say? What do you think? First try? <laughs> Here's hoping. You can totally feed them on stream. Oh, man. These guys are... Um, these guys are uh, very uh, feisty. <laughs> I am counting down the days until they can eat on their own. They're very sweet, but they're just super wriggly. All right, five minutes, I'll see you back here. <laughs> you join the feed for kittens. Well, I think we're gonna, we, I, might, uh, I might have a few pictures to show you when we get back from the break. Oh, thank you, Ramses.
Alrighty, folks, come on back. We got about a minute left, so get a drink of water and use the restroom or whatever you need to do. Um, and come on back. So MME asked, are um, all kittens or is the mama cat with them? Um, no, in this case, there is no mama cat, so I'm responsible for all the feeding, <laughs> day and night. Hence why I'm very tired, or one of the reasons anyway. Um, yeah. So I'm counting down the days until they can eat on their own. They're not quite ready yet. Um, they're almost old enough, just not quite. So we're getting there. All right, I'm going to get some photos pulled up here. I'm going to go ahead and stop the timer. Well, and then just give me just a second. And we're going to get some photos pulled up. Y'all don't get to see all my photos, just the one, just the ones I want to show you. So, all right, photos. Okay, sorry, I'm just getting there. All right. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> so the, none of them have names yet, so that is a channel point reward. If you would like to name a kitten, um, you may do so, spending your channel points to do it. Um, <laughs> All right, come on, next one. All right, so, yep, there's there's three of them. Um, this one has a little white on the foot. Um, this one is a little black and white. They're all girls. <laughs> and this one is super quiet and chill. Just likes to sit there and watch things. Yep, they're hard to get pictures of because they're always moving around. <laughs> As you can see from that picture, the motion blur, <laughs> always moving. Yep. Always busy. So yeah, they're, they're, they're about four weeks old. They're not quite old enough to eat on their own. Um, but they're very nearly there. I love that one. Cause just like the, the eyeballs, <laughs> just <laughs> no thoughts, head empty, you know, <laughs> Are these kittens in addition to the ones I was already fostering? So I received a call uh, late last weekend saying that I needed to take these guys and, and bring my, cur my current kittens back. So that happens sometimes. My other kittens were not quite old enough to go back, but these guys needed my help more. Um, so actually, I think it was more than it was a week, more than a week ago. Yeah. Um, so these guys just needed me more at the moment. And so they get my help. <laughs> Yeah, so the first and the third, they look so much alike that sometimes I can't remember which one I've already fed. <laughs> so the only re the only way I can tell is that the one this one here has a little bit, you can't see it's behind the chat window, but they have a little white on one of their feet, and that's the only way I can tell the difference. Otherwise they look identical. Yeah. Yes, and Hatricia, um Hatricia is going to be claiming one of the kittens to name. Um and so uh because they named one before, but then like the very next day they had to go back to the shelter. So they didn't even get the chance to see their kitten that they named. So I let them um, name one of these ones. So which one did you want, Patricia? There, so there's two tabbies, this one and this one. One of them? Okay. Would you want to name the one? So why don't you name the one with the white on the foot? That They have a little bit of white. This one here on the screen right now has a little bit of white on their foot. Oh, you want the last one. Okay, this one? Which one? Better one, better three. <laughs> this one. Okay, perfect. You get this one. Cool. The other, that means there's two still up for grabs if anybody wants to spend their channel points to name that one. <laughs> All right, let's get back to the code. But I just thought we, we deserved a little kitten interlude at the moment. Um, yes. So let's get back to the code and finish out our controllers. So before the break, we went ahead and coded our home controller. 
And then we, the next thing, so the, the, there were two control, there were two um, methods that we wanted to add to our um, index controller. One of them was get home and the other one was get search. So for get search, uh, we're gonna need to handle search requests that come in from the search bar, which is located on our homepage. Uh, so what render is doing, all render is doing is it's rendering a view. It's rendering our index.ejs view. And what's cool about views is that we can pass in data to those views. So in this case, we're passing in a few things. We're passing in a title. We're passing in the data that we retrieved from the database, which our, our view is going to use to render that on the page. Uh, we're passing in a default values for our search bar, which is nothing. And then we're also passing information about whether or not the user is logged in. So we're just passing in this data and then our view is set up to handle that and perform certain actions based on what we tell it. Okay. We need kitten entertainment every break. <laughs> Needs more dog. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can, I can definitely show you my dog um, at some point. Yeah, he's right here on the couch beside me. It's just hard for me to get my camera like angled down and then get it back. But I'll figure, I'll figure it out. I'll figure out a way to show you the dog. Because yes, he's very cute. All right. So for our get search, essentially what we're going to want to do is um, basically just run a query against the database based on whatever the user typed inside of the search box. So for this, again, we're going to have an asynchronous function, um, rec and res. And again, we're going to want to be accessing the menus schema. So I'm just going to grab these two variables from up here and plop them down here. Because again, we're going to be referencing this, the menu schema. We're going to need user session data. Um, but we're also going to need the query that the user, <coughs> excuse me, the query that the user typed in to the search bar. So I'm going to say let query equals, and from the body, I'm going to grab the input. Because remember, the, the user is searching via a form, right? So they're, they're typing the search information into a form, clicking the button, and so that data is being sent up. And so we have access to that data. So in order to access that, I can just say rec.body. And then that data is called search input. That's just that's just what was sent up from the form. Okay, so menu query. Um, I'm also just going to set a, create another variable called um, menu data. Just empty for now. We've got our session data. And then. For all you regex fans out here, we're going to use just a little bit of regex to um, actually make the like create the the um, thing that we're going to be searching in the database for. Um, yeah, if you want to see the .env file, Trine, um, you can just go to the repo. So go to the GitHub repo with the finished code. Wait, no, actually, it's not in there. Sorry, no, it's not. Yeah, we'll look at the, we'll look at, after we finish this controller, we'll, we'll pop back to the env file for you. Yeah. All right, so let's make our query with a little bit of regex. I don't know what this does, but I'm sure somebody does. I just copied and pasted because I'm cool like that. All right. So I'm going to pop in some regex here. Regex. up caret plus Q. So what this looks like is it's taking our search input, right? And saying regex something plus that input. And then we're also gonna set an option. Options I. And I think that probably means something like inclusive. So like when we do the search against the database, we're going to want to find, um, you know, it like, for example, if I have a restaurant called Taco Rico and I just type taco into the search box, I would want to find everything with the word taco in the name, right? I is ignore case. Okay. Starts with and ignore case. Okay. Fair enough. Starts with your search input. Okay. So in that case, 
I would maybe want to refine this a little bit, right? Because I would probably want it to be inclusive of everything. So if it has taco anywhere in the name, I would probably want to find that from the database. So this might be something that I that I go back and change later. For now, we'll just leave it, but it's good to know that that's exactly what that's looking for. Yeah, if you had a place called Rico Taco, that wouldn't work. So I'm going to want to change this. Um, we'll leave it as is for now, just because I literally like don't have time to change it, but that's definitely something that'll go on the list. <laughs> so for now, it's just looking for starts with, but Feature, feature improvement opportunity. Takariku just triggered my hunger. <laughs> yeah, my dog's head has been in a couple of past streams, but now that I have a standing desk, it's really not tall enough to see him. So, or he's really not tall enough for you know you to see him anymore. I used to be sitting down, and so he'd come, but you know right here. But nah. Hey, nerd and iron, welcome. Good to see you, my friend. Okay, so we've set up all of our variables. We've got our search parameters. Um, and now let's actually do some logic. All right, so first thing we wanna check is to see if the query term is null. So if that query term is null, oops, or sorry, if that query term is not null. So making sure that the user actually did type something into the search box and that we have something to look for, right? So if it's not null, then we're just gonna do a find. So menu results equals await menu dot find search for the actual query item. And again, we're you know questionable then syntax here, but that's okay. Um, to then take the data. format this a little better. There we go. Then take the data and set our variable for menu data equal to the data that we got back. Okay, so what did we just do there? Well, what we did is we went up to the menu collection in the database and we said, hey, Mongoose, please go find anything that matches this query. So starts with our search parameter and ignore case. So if I typed in taco into the app, it would come back with taco rico as a result. And so then we just take that data and we assign it to this variable here. Yeah. Okay. And if the search parameter is empty, then what we'll do instead is, let me just fix this. If that's empty, then what we'll do instead um, is just have an else here. Set our query value equal to just the word search. I'm not sure if that's necessary, but we'll roll with it. And just then return all of the results. And you know, so if, if the search parameter is empty, then just it should just return everything again, um, just like it would by default. So. If that's empty, then we just want to find everything. Okay. So essentially, if there is something to search for, then search for it. And if not, just return everything. And finally, what we're going to do is we found all this data, but we need to send it into the view in order for the view to actually display it, right? So we're going to do it just a res.render here. And I'm going to copy it from up above. We're going to do a res.render. We're going to render index. Title is going to be menu tracker. Um, data is going to be menu data our search is going to be whatever we searched for, right? Because after a search, after I do a search, I want to see both the results and the term that I actually searched for. So we're just changing that to be whatever the query was, and then the logged in information just as before. Uh, the question was, do you do anything about limiting the number of records coming back from the database? Not for this particular app, but you could. 
Yeah, you could. If you if you knew that you were going to maybe get way too many records p- potentially, um, yeah, you could absolutely um, you could absolutely limit that the number of records that come back, which is probably good if you're expect you know if you, if a query could potentially return like you know several thousand records, then yeah, you would want to limit that. Yep, and piece of shoot said you could just do you could just say limit five or limit ten or whatever you want. Uh, line eighteen. Yeah, so what this is doing is basically just setting up the when, when we send this. So essentially, we're we're just taking this query and we're putting it into our find method down here, right? And so what we're setting up here is the parameters of that search. So in this case, we're just saying, hey mongoose, only look for things that start with the, with our query and ignore case. So if it's uppercase, just ignore that. It doesn't matter. Um, just search for anything that matches. So we're, this is just the properties of the specific properties of the query that we want to do. Yeah, and you could you could you know we could have just put it down here straight into the find statement, but I think putting it up here does make it a little clear. Sure. Is it possible to use more awaits if I'm sending more than one query query to the database in the same method? Yeah, I mean you could await multiple database operations. Sure. Yeah. Okay, then we have our render at the end. <clears throat> All right, and then that takes care of both of the methods that we need for our home page. We can do searches, we can display the data, we can render the page. Awesome. So that's that controller done. Now let's go ahead and go to our login control. We'll just do them in order. Now you may not recall, but let's let's look really let's look again at what um, different operations we have for our login controller. We know we're going to need to be able to display the login page. We're going to need to be able to display the sign up page. We're going to need to be able to perform a logout operation. We're going to need to be able to send login data up to the uh, controller or up to the um, you know database for validation, and we're going to need to be able to add new users as well. So those are the things that we're going to need need to be able to handle login wise. Um, so let's go ahead and code those. Okay. So I'm gonna do this one slightly differently just because I noticed that that was kind of how Leon did it in his version of the app. Um, for each of the login operations, like authentication operations, um, the way he did it was actually exporting them separately. So doing like exports dot and then the method. So I'm just going to do that here. I'm not saying that you have to, you could group them together like we did in the other one as like one um, module dot exports. But in this case, I'm just going to do each one separately just because I can. It's fun to mess around with different things to do, right? Oh, and somebody mentioned they wanted to see my dot env file. Um, so I can do that as well for you here. So the .env file, all it has is just the database string and the port. That's all. So for whoever needed that, does that give you what you need there? Just the database string and the port, nothing spectacular. Does that help you? Hope so. Okay, well, let me know if you need to see that again, um, as far as the uh, uh, ENV file, we can look at it again uh, toward the end. Okay, so for this one, we're just gonna do each one separately, um, export them separately, and it still works just fine. Um, however, we are gonna need to require one more thing inside of our login.js. Uh, when we're sending passwords to and from the database, um, we're going to need to make sure that those passwords are not stored in plain text, right? So that if, if somebody got into my database, they would not, they should not, should never be able to just see my passwords as is, right? They should always be hidden or obscured in some way. And so the way we're gonna do that is we are gonna use something called bcrypt. This is what Leon is using as well. It seems to be pretty popular, not bcrypt, bcrypt. One of one of, of my, your devs put all the passwords in clear text on the database. Oh my goodness. That is a major no-no, but you would be amazed 
and how many major corporations can't seem to figure that out. <laughs> They're storing stuff in plain text and notepad files and on databases and yeah. So, but we're going to be, we're going to be a little bit better and we're going to use Bcrypt instead. Yeah. Okay. So for the first one, get login. Um, essentially all this is doing is just displaying the login page. So if somebody clicks that they want to log in, we want to just render that login page for them. So fairly straightforward, just rec and res and res.render the login page. And again, since this is EJS, we can pass in some properties to this page. So I'm going to pass in a title of login. I'm going to specify that the user is not currently logged in because they're not, they're, they're, they're going to the login page, false. And there is the potential that, to, to show errors on this page. So we're going to start with a null value for errors. And then if, if there are any errors, we will display those on the page. So this is just some properties that our EJS needs in order to render properly. So login page, give it a title, say that the user is not logged in and no errors currently. Okay, the next one is going to be get sign up, which is going to be very similar. So I'm just going to copy and paste. Get sign up. Yeah, okay. And this page is going to be called new account. Title is going to be new account. Logged in false and error null. Let me in used everywhere. <laughs> You caught it in dev? Oh, that's good. I'm glad you were looking out for that. The, the fact that you're, one of your developers was storing passwords in plain text. I'm glad. That's why dev environments are so great. I've actually worked for a fairly large company that did not have any dev environments for their production database. Let that sink in for a moment. There was no dev environment for this multi-bajillion dollar company. We did everything. I was a database person for them. Um, we did everything in prod, everything. Everything was a screen test. It was wild. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not gonna tell you which employer it was, but yeah. <laughs> but your product has seven different environments. That's how it should be, right? And my current Oracle database at my current employer actually has, yeah, I think we have five environments that we can that we can do stuff in and we have to deploy up through every single one, right? So it gets checks at every single environment, which is how it should be. Yeah, sometimes, sometimes, uh, sometimes practices are wild in, in these, um, in some of these companies. <laughs> exactly, Caitlin. <laughs> <laughs> That's the perfect emoji for that situation. Yep. Literally, I like, I, man, there was one time I ran a, um, there was one time I ran an, uh, for, for those of you who do know SQL, there was one time I ran an update statement and I forgot my where clause. And the only reason that the entire like building didn't burn down was because I had done it against such a large table that it took like 30 seconds to even like read the records. Cause it, it always, it, it reads in, it, it reads down the records first and then starts updating them. And so I caught it before it actually started to do the updates and I was able to kill it. I was able to kill the query. And that was the only reason that I did not bring down like the entire production environment of, like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. J. Felipe. Yeah. Yeah. People lose their, yeah. Well, but the thing is there was no dev environment. There was nothing, there was no testing environment. So every, you had to be perfect all the time. And it's just, that's not physically possible. <laughs> I had the same thing with an e-commerce company and we went live with everything for $1.25 or 125 euros. Oh man. Yep. It's, it's wild out there, my friends. It is wild. 
Okay, so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to get the um, the log out. So uh, log out is actually going to be pretty simple. Um, so I'm glad that we're learning, you know, at least partially best practices here with Leon, because I certainly like in my career so far, I feel like I don't have a great grasp of best practices just because I've been exposed to so many really bad practices that it's good to learn some, some actual proper ways to do things. Um, which is nice. Okay, so when we log out, what we're gonna wanna do is destroy the current session. So rec.session.destroy, destroy, destroy. So we just destroy that session and then we redirect back to the home page. And for this particular app, like since we, again, since we're not using Passport, um, we're just kind of doing everything with sessions and then just doing kind of brute force comparisons um, against usernames and passwords in the database. So again, best practices, I'm gonna get this upgraded to use Passport, um, just not at the moment. Those are some wild stories. <laughs> Where is the session stored? Yeah, so there actually is a session collection in the database. Um, so cute kitten, hooray. Um, there is, so we have our sessions stored in here. Oh, what? Oh, it must've logged me out. Okay. That's weird. Hey, what are you doing, MongoDB? Stop that. Yeah, it logged me out. Back in. Okay, so in the database, we actually have a sessions um, right here. We have a sessions collection, which is storing that session data. Yeah. Okay, so we destroy the session and then we redirect back to the home page. So that's three of the methods that we need, all of our gets. And then our last two methods for login. So we've done our three gets here. Our last two are where we're actually like sending login data and sign and allowing users to sign up. So these last two posts here. So let's do that. Uh, we can also use Mongo's export. Yeah, so natural call, yeah, you could absolutely do that. Yep. This is just a different way to do it. Uh, again, it's just practicing with different ways of doing things, right? So here we're doing individual exports. You could also group them together into a single export. Yeah. Uh, does session.destroy actually remove the session saved in Mongo? I don't know. We can test it out. Yeah, and I, I kind of agree with you, Seku. I think it does not. I think it just... Um, destroys like the local, yeah, the local understand the client side um, session. Yeah, I think I agree. Um, I don't think it actually deletes it, but we'll, well, we can test it if we have time or you can test it too. You could always run it and see what it does in the database. Okay, so we, let's do our net two post methods next. All right, so this is what happens when somebody actually tries to log in. So this is where it gets a little bit interesting. I'm gonna do exports dot post login and we're going to have an async function here because we're going to be talking to the database so async rec and res so we want that to be async because we're talking to the database and now we're going to be grabbing the email and the password that the user is logging in with and testing those against what's already in the database right <laughs> That was my assumption, but you know what they say about assumptions. Indeed, I do. Yes. All right. So email, we're going to just have a few variables here to make things easier to work with. So from the body, because remember, again, this is a form. So the login is a form. And inside of that form, we have email. And we have a password. Let pass equals rec body password input and we're going to have a login success variable that's going to be either true or false based on whether or not the login was successful login success again we're going to have our session data let's sesh 
just going to have a little login sesh, rec session, and then we're going to set um, our logged in value to false. And this time we're going to be reaching, we're going to be interacting with the user's schema. So in order to target that schema, I'm going to say let users equals schemas dot users. So this is going to tell, um, this is going to tell this method exactly which schema it should be using. Um, Saku says, do we change the name of the file? Currently it is login.js, and that seems to be not precise enough, I think. Yeah, you could have this call be like auth.js, like authentication.js, or something more specific. Certainly, yeah, absolutely. Yep, this is that, you're, you're right, that name is probably not clear enough. Um, and so, you, you are, yeah, you can absolutely rename that. Just make sure that you name, rename it throughout, right? You need to make sure that if you have anything that's referencing that file, you also you know fix that too. But VS Code is sometimes pretty good at warning you about that. If you change a file name, it might say like, do you need, do you want to change all references to this file? And I'm like, yes, please. So yeah, VS Code has my back in so many different ways, right? It's so nice. As someone who um, got my start coding in Notepad, um, I, VS Code is like a miracle. <laughs> I mean, literally, Notepad plus plus like coding in that, or not even Notepad++, like just Notepad. Um, so VS Code is like magic. All right, and then we're gonna actually have, so we have our user schema, and then we're gonna have the specific query. So what we're gonna be finding inside of that user schema. And so what we're gonna be looking up against is the email that the user typed in, right? So whatever, whatever email they typed in, to that login box, we're gonna to wanna to send that up to the database and reference it against the email addresses that are already in there. And then we'll do a, then we'll compare the passwords. One thing I like to do with tutorials is change the variable names or rewrite code on the fly. Yeah, absolutely. I actually did quite a bit of that with this tutorial already. Um, <laughs> I changed quite a few things, including the structure, how it connects to the database, how it sets up the server. Um, yeah, so if you ever go back and watch the original tutorial, it'll be pretty different. Um, but yeah, there's still a lot more I want to change. Always more. But yeah, I agree. It's good to um, change things on the fly as you go. Okay, so we know what we're looking for. Now, let's actually um, see if we can find an account. So first thing we're going to say, hey, if the email value is not empty and oops and and the password value is not empty that should be double okay then check against the database and see if there's an account so See if you can find one user that matches the email address. If you do find it, again, we've got this questionable use of then, but that's okay. Then, this is, now this is really interesting what they're doing here. I guess I didn't notice this before, but uh, this is gonna get a little wild. It still works, it's just a little wild. So, I'm gonna have to, uh, Pull down your, your code weenie blindfolds for a minute here. Just enjoy the magic. All right. Then do another async. Nested. <laughs> this is why we use Passport, people. All right. So if we have data, so if, if, if we got data back from that query, <laughs> if we got data back from that query, if there is data, then check the password, right? So first we see if the email address matches, and then we're gonna check and see if the password matches. So 
This is the uh, this is probably the worst async application of async await that I've ever seen, but it still works, and that's the cool thing. So what we're gonna do is we're going to use a built-in bcrypt method called compare. So bcrypt has a built-in method that can compare hashed passwords against like raw passwords. So we're just gonna compare these two. So the, the one that we're gonna compare, compare the password that the user typed in and the password that was already in the database. So the hash password and the plain password, we can compare them both. Another then. And if it's a match, oh gosh, I love this. It's so terrible. If it's a match, then set the logged in session to true. Whoops, not that. Not search, sesh. There we go. Fourth time's a charm. Sesh.logged is true. And gosh dang it. Stop it. VS Code is, okay, VS Code is not being my friend at the moment. There we go. And login success is also true. Okay, so what is this monstrosity doing? Well, all it's really doing is it's looking in the database to see if it can find a matching email address. And if it finds it, then it takes that, takes the password that's stored with that database entry and checks it against the password that the user inputted in plain text. And it uses bcrypt.compare to compare them both and see if they match. Hazel says, time to go back to Notepad. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. VS Code is still my friend. I love you, VS Code. Okay. I'm just checking my, uh, I feel like I might have too many parentheses. Hang on. This is like impossible to parse. So yeah, basically I think you could, you could just do all of this with like a couple of weights um, and it would be fine. So that's another one for the list. Query async data. Oh, there we go. That's the parenthesis I was missing. And so I need to get rid of one, which I will in a second. We're out of parenthesis. Okay, data. Do the compare is match. Oh, and then I'm missing one more thing here. So if it's a match, ah. if is match, then set these values. Okay. We'll see if I've got my parentheses right. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, the hash key is um, actually in my server.js right now. Um, oh, sorry, I mean the, the, the hash, um, like the salt and hash information. Um, yeah, so we'll be doing that in, um, in just a little bit. Okay, so then if login success is true, so if they pass the login test, if login success is true, if they were able to log in, then just send them to the home page, which will show them all of the restaurant data, redirect them home, perfect. If they were not able to log in, Then we're gonna we're gonna just gonna go ahead and render the login page again, and send an error which will show up on the page. So I'm just gonna copy and paste this. It's just a res dot render. Render the login page title. They're not logged in, and send an error as well. Okay, so how is is match filled? Well, so what this is doing is it's doing it's awaiting the, the result of this bcrypt compare. And then it's taking that result and patching it, passing it to is match. 
So that's just the result of this operation, which I assume is going to be either true or false. I don't know for sure, but if I had to guess, I would say that this is probably true or false. Yeah. And again, this could probably be handled with like, you know, two awaits without being having to be nested until kingdom come. But, you know, there you go. It still works, right? Okay. Hey, IK Rasper. Oh, VS Code hover on is match. Yeah, so it's a Boolean. If we hover on it there, it says it's a Boolean. So that makes sense with what it's doing. All right, so now we're going, the next thing we're gonna do, so this is for logins. And so we just need to do something very similar for, um, we just need to do something very similar for signups, right? Make sure there's not an existing user, send in the username and password and post those up to the database. Are we using user result and pass result? No, that was just how this person, uh, the person who wrote the tutorial um, decided to handle these awaits. Um, yeah, they just assigned to these variables here. We don't use them though. Because they're ch because we're chaining it together with a then. So it's it's taking the result of that promise and just passing it in. Is this Express? Yeah, we're using Express um, for a lot of this. Yep. Express and bcrypt here. So like this is a bcrypt method. Okay, so that was the, the first of the two options, right, was login. Now for the next one, we're gonna do a sign up. So I'm gonna grab some of this for, I'm gonna grab, let's see, email and password. I'm gonna grab this stuff and I'm gonna say exports is gonna be post sign up. Okay, async break and res, email and password. And then the first thing we're gonna check again is making sure that email and password are both populated fields. So just like we did before, we're gonna say if they're populated, if they're both populated, then we're gonna be hitting the user schema. Ah, oh, come on. There we go. <laughs> and our query is again going to be looking at email addresses. So I can grab that from up here. Okay. And then again, similarly, we're going to do, we're, 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 first we're going to query the database and see if a user already exists with that same email address. And if they don't, then we're going to create a new user in the database with that email address and a salted and hashed password, right? Because we don't store passwords in plain text in the database. So we're going to upload that email and we're going to run the password through Bcrypt, scramble it all up, and then send it up to the database. So those are the two things we're going to do next. All right. Let user search. We're going to try it. First, we want to see if we can find a user that matches. Checking against the email address. And if we don't, Yeah, okay, checking the data and passing that in. And if there are no matches, so if that data is empty, no matches on the find, then we do all this stuff with the password. So here we're gonna use um, bcrypt a little bit and we're going to salt and hash it. So I don't know what this stuff is necessarily yet, but that's okay, we can still use it anyway. I just know that it's helping make it encrypted. So we're gonna salt, salt it 10 times, 
salted and hashed yummy indeed <laughs> salt rounds is 10 and then we're gonna pass the salt and do some stuff with decrypt whatever this is I assume this is just telling bcrypt to salt it um, X number of times and again some atrocious use of async await but whatever I thought the whole point of async await was that you don't have to nest things but this person found a way to do it now it's okay I still think that I still really like this tutorial and there's always things that can be improved right so as we learn more we refactor and we get better. Okay. And so we've salted it and then we're also going to hash it. Async callback. <laughs> Bcrypt dot hash. As far as I'm aware, do salt and hash. So for those of you who do know a little bit more, um, do salt and hash always go hand in hand in this way? So we salt and we hash. Pass salt. <laughs> Piece of sheet says you can do that with a single line of code. Yeah, I think you can. <laughs> you can salt directly using hash now. Oh, neat. That's good to know. Well, that'll be on the refactor list as well. Pass salt and then Okay. Pass the salt from my French fries. <laughs> uh, pass salt. All right. Then one more. One more level. We got to go deeper. What was that? Inception? Yeah. One more level into the dreamscape. Okay. Now we finally get to set the values. We've done all the stuff that we have to do with salting and hashing. And now we can finally set the values that we're actually writing to the database. So password is hash. And we're setting a level here Oops. of admin. I don't know what that's for, but just rolling with it at this point. Setting up an account and finally setting up the new user. Let's see, one thing I want to check here. Sneeze.users. Sorry, I just need to look at something. Okay, good. And then finally, so we create the new user. And then finally we save it. Okay. <laughs> Fisa she says, await oh, bcrypt hash password 10 does the same as what I just wrote. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I'll definitely fix that. <laughs> In this case though, I feel like this is too much, right? Like this could definitely be streamlined and still be like perfectly readable. So um, just my thought. However, that doesn't mean it's bad. It still works. It could just be better. All right. So finally, after we after we set up that um, you know new user information, last thing we're going to do is actually render the login page because with this particular app, after you create a new account, we still want to. It still wants you to go ahead and log in with your um, new credentials. So, which is fine. It's not a bad thing. And this was all inside of a giant if statement. So now we just do our else. So if the login was not successful, then we're just going to go back to the new account page. So again, just another res.render, back to the new account page, and send an error. I bought this ultra wide monitor. I will use all the wideness. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, the extra screen real estate is really helping. Back when I still back when I just had my little 1080p monitor, um, there were some times when I was on stream and I could hardly tell what was going on because everything was so tightly wrapped. Okay, I do think I have a parenthesis error somewhere, which is always fun. Gotta love all that nesting. Okay, let me see if I can spot it. Too much nesting. Salt async error hash. How do you survive today with more than one with <laughs> without more than one monitor? Yeah, no, it's I don't know how people do it. It's really hard. Okay, what I might have to do, I do I don't really want to spend a bunch of time like just looking for a missing parenthesis. So I'm just gonna grab the finished function from my finished the finished method from my finished code and just let the parenthesis fix itself. So but it's it's the same as what we just typed, just with whatever parenthesis I missed. There you go. <laughs> all fixed. It's all better. All right. Save that. Now, do I still have something missing? Gosh, dang it. Maybe I'm missing a closing parenthesis. It's the worst. Or a comma. Yeah, I'm missing a comma. It's the comma. There we go. Maybe. Hey, Akechi, you joined just in time to watch me try to find a missing parenthesis. Oh, and I'm missing a bunch of parentheses here. Wait, no, those don't need parentheses. Sorry. So I'm missing something else. What am I missing? Hmm. Oh, I think I'm missing one here. There. That fixed it. Hooray. I missed my closing bracket on the previous export. <laughs> okay, whew, that was wild, huh? Well, we finished all of our login controllers. We've got our index controllers done. We've got our login controllers done. And the last thing is our menu controllers. Now this is more straightforward, um, you know, CRUD operations, but I do think I'm gonna have to keep you in suspense for just a little bit because I think we are gonna have to take a break because I really do, I'm gonna need to, to feed my foster kittens. And so, um, you know, they are on a schedule, so I do need to feed them, but I really want to finish this. Um, so what, there's two things I could do. I could take a long break, we could take a long break until I'm done feeding my foster kittens and we could come back and I could, and I could, you know, finish all these methods or, um, I could just grab these crud operations from the last controller. We could review what they do and then we could test the app and then I could end the stream and then feed my foster kittens. So which do you prefer long break or I just kind of drop those additional methods in there into the into the remaining controller we review what they do um we test the app and then we kind of wrap up <laughs> need to see live kittens <laughs> okay poll please sure we can do a poll well it'll be a short poll but we'll yeah we'll go ahead and do that All right, two seconds. Okay. Long break or copy and paste. And the duration, we'll just do a one minute poll. So real quick. <laughs> All right, go for it. Poll is running. So 
Be sure to vote. Okay, long break is winning. So I would think that I think the break will be um, probably about um, 15 to 20 minutes. I'll have a timer going, um, but it'll be muted. So um, be sure to vote in the poll. And the poll is available now if you didn't see it. It's at the top of the chat. Um, Two days break. <laughs> All right. So we have so long break wins. Um, that's what we'll do. So I'm gonna put um, I'm gonna put 20 minutes on the timer. It might not take that long. It might take a little longer. I don't know. Um, but I'm gonna put 20 minutes on the timer, and then when we come back, um, we will finish out our last controller. We'll test the app make sure it works and then we'll wrap it up all right so y'all get to watch the the timer click the, the timer uh tick down for 20 minutes have fun with that <laughs> see you christmas all right 20 minutes start actually i'm wait whoa Okay, apparently the Google timer is not equipped to handle values in the double digits. <laughs> what the heck? Why are you like this? <laughs> okay, hang on, I'm gonna reset that. So this is a, this is, <laughs> this is a potential uh, design flaw, I think, in the timer um, response. <laughs> what timer do you, link do you use? Just whatever, the, the, the built-in Google timer. Okay, again, I'm gonna, okay, reset and start. And all right, see you back in 20 minutes. All right, I'm off.
Okay, folks, uh, we got about five minutes left in the break. I'm actually done feeding the foster kittens, but we're just gonna let the timer run out um, just to give folks time to get back if they stepped away for a minute. So yeah, I'm, we'll just hang out for a minute and uh, give folks time to come back. So um, while we're waiting on that, I wanted to slow down just a little bit and see, I mean, does anybody have any questions for me? Anything they wanna ask just in general? Um, I'm happy to answer questions for, you know, four minutes or so until everybody comes back. <laughs> But yeah, let me know if anybody has, you know, questions about me or what I do or 100 devs or anything or the project or anything like that. Did I ever finish playing straight? No, I still haven't finished it, which is wild, right? Oh, I, I love it. It's like I want to have like, you know, the perfect time to finish. But no, I haven't actually finished it yet. Say, I'm still saving it for you guys. Yeah, it's so good, though. I also have a Lego set that I really want to build on stream. Um, would you guys be interested in, like, a Lego stream? Where I just, like, literally build a Lego set? And, like, we just talk and stuff? It's the, um, and if it, if it helps at all, it's the, uh, uh, it, it's the, what is it called? Uh, the tall neck from horizon zero dawn. Um, they made a Lego set of that, which I think is just rad. And I literally have the set, um, just like sitting and still in the box. Cause I was like, I wanted to see if people wanted me to build it on stream. Um, yeah, it's the tall neck from horizon zero dawn. Yeah. I wish they made more horizon zero dawn sets because I would literally buy them all. Yeah, I would have to like I'll have to like change my camera settings and stuff for um for, for it, but I think that I think we can manage that. Yeah, I'll have to figure out what to do with my camera so I can mount it like vertically so it's like pointing down. I want it like pointing down at my hands um so that you know, you just see my hands while I'm building, but I'll figure something out. I used to buy my kids Legos just so I could put them together. <laughs> Don't you mean you bought Kids, you know, you bought some Legos for your kids and then you bought more sets for yourself. That's the way, you, that's the way you should do it. If you're streaming, you're building Legos, but with kittens and doggo in the background. Oh my goodness. That would be a bit of a challenge, I think. <laughs> I don't know how I can manage that. Yeah, Rascal, I love Horizon Zero Dawn too. Um, it's like one of my favorite games of all time. I was um, just thinking, man, I need to like replay the first game again. And then I want to buy the second game. Ugh. So many games, so little time. Could create a Lego representation of MVC. <laughs> Alrighty, we got about a minute left. So if folks are just kind of having me on... Um, you know, playing out loud while they're out doing other stuff in the moment. Um, come on back if you're coming back. We got about a minute left in our long break. Thank you for all for sticking with me. Um, and then we will finish our last controller and see if all this stuff that we did actually works. Who knows? It's a mystery. First try. I don't know. I feel like you're going to jinx it. <laughs> okay. Should have had my camera on for that. Oh, well. All right. I'm going to go ahead and stop the timer. That was super weird how it, like, wrapped so oddly. But, well, there we go. Okay, let's go back to the code. We finished our login controller. And is that gonna beep? Hang on. Okay, good, I stopped it, awesome. All right, 
Um, we finished our index controller. We finished our login controller. Now really all that's left is just the basic CRUD operations that we're handling via our um, menu controller here. So this is more about like the, you know, create, read, update, delete for just the menu items. Yeah, okay. All right, so again, we're requiring our schemas that we already built. Um, and this time we're gonna go back to just module exports format. Again, either one is fine. Um, just kind of playing around with different ways to do this. Um, I'm not sure which one I like better yet, but that'll be something that'll come with time. So the first thing that we want to do is just handle any requests to just display, um, to, to just display our index.ejs. Um, so in order for that, that's going to be very similar to the previous request that we've done. So for just git index. All we're going to do is just do a render rec res next. This could probably just be done. This could just be rec and res. We don't need the next. Res.render. And we're going to pass this page in with a title of just express. Actually, no, it shouldn't be express. It should be um, just menu items. We'll just call it that. It doesn't really matter. All right. The first thing that just handles any gets. Now, the next thing we're going to do is next thing we're going to handle is any edit requests. So if we click on the button to edit, if we click on the button to edit a menu item, then what we want is to be able to send a command up to the database to essentially edit an existing item, right? Okay. Actually, no, I think what this is gonna do is, let me just double check here. I think what this is gonna do is it's all it's going to do first is it's just going to grab the menu item that we're searching for and put it into like the edit window. So we have an edit window where we can edit a menu item. This is going to grab that item, drop it in there so it's ready for us to edit. Now, there's a, there's a later method that we're going to do, which is called save menu. And that's going to be where we're actually going to send an edit you know, request up to the database and save that new data. So the first thing we're going to do is just the essentially the display, oops, sorry, the display for the um, edit page. So grabbing the menu item and dropping it onto the edit page so we can make edits. So we're gonna do that first. So again, we're talking to the database. So we're gonna have an async function, rec and res. All right, we're gonna, we are gonna do some validation here to make sure that nobody is going to be able to edit stuff if they're if they don't have a valid session. So in order to do that, we're going to validate their session here and just say, hey, if they are not logged in, so if sesh dot logged in is not true, if they're not logged in, then render the menu and essentially send an error that says invalid request. Okay, res.render, actually here, I'm just going to copy this, res.render the menu, res render menu, with the title of edit, but instead of passing in data, we're just going to pass in a logged in value of false, so it's not going to display anything that the user can use. Right? Shouldn't it shouldn't display anything that the user can edit if they're not logged in? So false, and our error is going to just going to be invalid request. And it should throw that error if they try to get in there. Okay, so we just render that, and then if they are logged in, if they are logged in. 
then we're going to query the database. Okay, uh, Dan815 says, this is a bit off topic. I've been looking in random places. Anybody know where we can try out the API for Dolly or Dolly2? Um, I wanna try out those AI image generators. So I have actually, I actually got uh, an invite to, to use Dolly um, and I have been using Dolly for a little while. Um, I don't know if it's open access now or not. Uh, it might be. Um, and you can just use like their image prompt, their browser like image generator um, fairly easily. You don't have to hook up to their API or anything. Uh, if you actually want to hook up to the API, um, then I think it does cost money. Um, you might get a certain amount of free credits, um, but yeah, there's a there's a small charge for like using their their actual API tools and like hooking your app to it. Um, but if you just want to use the generator in browser, um, you get a you get a limited number of free credits per month. Yeah, Dan, uh, remind me at the end, and I can see if I can find that for you. Um, I can at least get you the website, and then you can see if you need what you need to do to get access. Because I got an I got an email invite that. Um, allowed me to start using it, but it might be open now. I'm not sure. Yeah, no worries. Okay. Yeah, don't let me forget, Dan, okay? All right, so if they are logged in, then we're gonna grab the ID of the item that they would like to edit, right? Because that's the only way we can find it in the database. And we're also just going to set an empty error value in case anything goes wrong. And we're going to be talking to the menu schema. Let menu equals schemas dot menu. And we're going to be querying on the specific ID that we want to look for. So our query is going to be where the ID of the item in the database underscore ID equals the ID of the item that was clicked on, right? So database ID with the underscore equals the ID of, of the item that was clicked on. And then in the end, we're actually going to do the query. So let item results equals await menu.find. Again, we're just doing a find, nothing crazy. Query that. Then if we got a result, we're gonna take that item data and we're gonna check and see if we got something back, right? So check and see, do a query, grab that item data, pass it in. And if the item data is null, if it's null, then we can just send back an error of invalid ID. However, if it's not null, if we did get something back, then we can just do a res.render. Res.render, we're gonna render our menu with a title of edit menu. Logged in is going to just be their logged in value from the session. I think, it could, I think that could actually just be true, but whatever. Um, and then any errors will just be passed through. So that will render it with whatever was found and it should be ready for the user to make edits if they would like to. Okay, so all that for just a query and then rendering the menu with the, with the item to edit. Oh, thank you for sharing that waitlist there, Rascal. Yeah, so there is a waitlist still for Dolly if you want to use the Dolly image generator, but I think I was on the waitlist for two or three months, maybe? I don't remember. It's a pretty long waitlist. Um, yeah, unfortunately. But yeah, go ahead and join the list and you can use Midjourney or um, there's, what is the other one? Um, um, Midjourney, and then what's the one that's like the like the the slightly less powerful version of Dolly? Crayon, that's it. Yeah, there's also Crayon, which is pretty good too, um, and I believe that one's pretty free too, which is nice. All right, so we did our Git, we've done our edit. Let's do our delete. 
complete uh, delete menu. Again, we're going to be talking to the database. Oops. Oh, got an extra space there. Sorry. Rec and res. Again, we're going to check and make sure that the user has a valid session. And if they're not logged in, we're just going to send them back to the login page. So if they try to delete something, if they're somehow able to click the delete button, but their session has expired, we essentially just want to redirect them back to the login page. So if, if that is false, then just redirect them back to the login page. Hey, uh, con concrete, concrete go. Sorry. <laughs> I'm sure I butchered that concrete co and Jerry, the old man. Welcome to you both. Welcome to the stream. We are just finishing up building an app that allows us to collect restaurant menus and store them all in one place. So it's really just for me. It's something I want. <laughs> I don't know if it'd be useful for anybody else, but it's going to be useful for me. So that's what we're building today. And we're just finishing it up. We're just finishing up the last of the controllers for our um, application here. All right, menu. So we're going to be hitting the menu schema again. And essentially this time we're just going to be sending up a delete request. So hitting our menu schema, menu equals schemas, oops, schemas dot menu. There we go. And we're going to grab the ID of the particular menu that we want to delete. Menu ID is going to be equal to rec params dot ID. We're going to be querying again. We're going to be querying on just the ID. Got a let there. There we go. Query equals ID. And then all we need to do is just await the result of that delete. Delete results. We just await that menu. And what's cool is that I love that Mongoose has so many like built-in methods that just do exactly what you want, right? Like I want to delete one thing. I'm going to say delete one and it just works. Boop, delete one. <laughs> and then after we do the, after we do the, the delete, we'll just redirect. And so that we can reload the page um, and see the list again without that item. So we delete the thing and then we just do a redirect. Save that. Perfect. So that was our delete. That one's fairly straightforward. And then the next thing we're going to do is we're going to control, we're going to handle our updates. So previously we populated the edit page and now we're actually going to handle the changes and putting those into the database. Uh, Carsey's asked, are you going to add some web scraping to this? Probably not, just because what I want this app to be is literally like a list of like my favorite restaurants or your favorite restaurants. So not automatically scraped, but literally like curated, right? If I see a, a restaurant that I want um, or that I enjoy, um, I can just drop them straight in there, have their menu and um, you know only have a curated list of the restaurants that I really want. Jerry says, I'm eight months into a 12 month full stack boot camp. Love coding now, working on Django. Oh, nice. Very cool. Yeah. So, we, uh, most of us on this stream, we are part, we're, we're sort of uh, working on a, uh, a full stack training course as well. Uh, it's free, it's called 100 Devs. Um, and yeah, there's no cost to it. Um, and so if you, if you want any like assistance, you know, with like your job hunt or whatever, Jerry, um, that's kind of the part of our course that we're starting now is the job hunt. Um, and so you're welcome to tune into the, to the classes on the job hunt and gain some skills with that, if that's interesting to you. So you can type in exclamation point Leon in the chat, if you would like to learn more again, it's all free. We have a discord, um, we're community taught. 
And um, it's uh, here, I'll, I'll do it for you there. The command is exclamation point Leon. And there's all the links that you can, that you need. Again, totally free. There's never no charge for anything. We're all just learning together. So I just typed it in there for you both. Uh, the link to the Discord is in the is in that Leon command. Um, awesome. <laughs> I think it might still be timing out there. All right, let's try it again. There you go. <laughs> that should be all the links that you need. But yeah, we're pretty chill. We're pretty fun. Uh, I am not one of the instructors. I just kind of help out. I, I'm on the stream team. Um, I'm one of the volunteer streamers. Um, we just do fun projects and homework together. Um, but the real classes are taught by Leon Noel, who's a fantastic teacher. A lot of fun. Um, and yeah, and all the classes are on YouTube as well if you want to see some of the older stuff. So yeah, welcome to the stream. Okay, so we did our delete and we did our save. Oh, and sorry, the next thing we're going to do is our save, save menu. And uh, I mean, and just FYI too, for the folks that are new here. So I am already a developer. I'm a SQL developer, um, but I'm learning web development. But a lot of the folks in 100 devs are brand new to coding, like all together. And they're picking it up on, as they go and everybody's doing great. So it's been a lot of fun. Okay, so for our save, again, we're going to be talking to the database. So we need rec and res. It's going to be async with rec and res. And once again, we're going to check and see if they're logged in. So I'm just going to grab all of this from up here. If they're logged in, we want to confirm that. Else. So sorry, if they're not logged in, then we want to just redirect them back to the home page or to the login page. Um, if they are logged in, then we can go ahead and save the menu. Hey, Simple 9 XP, welcome. Good to have you here. Okay, so if we want to write something new to the database, uh, we need to essentially set the values that we want to pass into that database object, right? So I'm just gonna grab some things out of that request.body. Again, it's all coming in from a form on the client side. So everything is just wrapped up real nice there in the body of our request. And we can just go in and pick out everything that we want from that form. So inside of our else here, I'm just gonna set a few variables. So our menu ID rec body menu ID, our menu name. And actually, I think I said, I think I said this was a new item and I misspoke there. This is the, this is the edited item that we previously put out on the page. So I misspoke there. I'm sorry. So this is the edited item item, which is why it has an ID menu name. The last thing we're going to do is for new items. This is just for existing items. So menu ID, which we already have, it's already in the database, so we have it. Menu name, menu icon, rec body, menu icon, uh, menu URL. And really the only reason why we're doing this is just to make it a little bit easier to read, right? We're shortening these from, you know, taking them out of the body, shortening them and putting them in variables just to make things a little bit easier to see. And you, you are, there we go. Okay. And the last thing we're going to do is just say, Hey, we're going to be talking to our schema, our menu schema menu. There we go. And that should be all the variables that we need. Oh, last one. Sorry. Our last variable is what we're querying on, which is literally the ID, just like we did before. I'm going to grab this from up here. Our query is going to be ID, where the ID of the database item equals the ID that we're passing in from our menu item. Dan says, how about adding maps to this app with similar restaurants? Yeah, you could do that. You could add like a Google, um, you know, hit the Google Maps API and like, have a little like thing you could click, which would, it would be neat if you had a little button that you could click, which would then take you to Google Maps and like automatically start navigation. That would be, that would be really cool. 
Yeah. For me, like, I feel, I feel like, yeah, Dan, uh, that's a, like, that's a great feature. I would think for like someone who's like a restaurant power user, you know, like if you were upon a person that went out to eat enough that you knew like everything, you know, at all the restaurants around you, that would be a super cool feature to have. Is Google Maps paid piece of shoot? That sucks. Is there a free one? Just for those, the, those that might want to use maps in their apps, maps in their apps. Um, is there a free version out there? Like is open, what is it? Open maps or something? Leaflet? Okay. Um, so what we're doing here is we're just setting up our save data and what we're going to be setting. So the valuables, so the values that we're going to be setting are going to be the name. The three values that we're storing in our database are the name, the icon, and the menu URL. And we're literally just going to set those to the, sorry, that was my dog. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> menu name, menu icon. You okay, buddy? He's fine. He had a chew, he had a chew toy and he, he chewed it up too fast. All right, so these are the values we're gonna be setting. And we need commas there. I've used Mapbox in the past, got some pretty good free tiers. Okay. <laughs> Did they get rid of the $300 free use of Google APIs? Oh, wow, that's pretty generous. Awesome though. Yeah, I don't know if they got rid of that or not. Okay, so we have the values we're gonna be setting and really all we need to do now is just update it. We're going to await. And again, with Mongoose being Mongoose, What's really cool is that there's a, there's a method that does exactly what we want, right? We want to update one item and there's a method for that, which I think is really cool. And we're just gonna pass in our query. So we're looking for the ID of the database item and passing in everything that we want to save, which is all of these things. Wait for that to be done. And in the end, then we just, we just want to redirect. I think you could also probably just do a reload here, but that's okay. Redirect and then show the updated data on the homepage. Oh no, actually, cause we're on the update update page right now. So after we update it successfully, then we want to redirect back home and see the updated values. So that's right. Okay, cool. So that's the end of that. And then the very last method that we're going to do today is for brand new menu items. So new menu, async, rec and res. I think I could type that in my sleep by now, which is a good thing, I suppose. Okay, once again, we're gonna do a check to make sure that they're logged in. So I'm just gonna grab this. If they're logged in, perfect. So if they're not logged in, send them back to the login page. If they are logged in, then do the stuff. Okay, so once again, we're gonna be reusing some variables here because again, whether we're updating or we're creating something new, we're gonna be passing in the same values, right? We're gonna still gonna, we're gonna need menu ID, menu name, menu icon, or sorry, menu name, menu icon, and menu URL. Those are the three values that we really care about. So I'm just gonna grab these and the schema. And those are gonna be the things that we're gonna be passing in when we create a new item. Um, now this time our query is gonna be slightly different. Since we're creating a new item, it won't have an ID, right? It's not in the database yet, so it won't have an ID. So what we're gonna do instead is we're gonna to have to query on something different. The best next thing for us to query on is going to be the, the name of the um, the name of the restaurant. So name, our query is going to be name where name is me, equals to menu name. So now we can actually do our query.
All right, and again, we're gonna await that result. So we're gonna query against the menu collection. And what, so all right, I'll let you guys fill in this one. What, um, what method do you think we should use here? So what we're doing is we're checking the database to see if a restaurant already exists with that same name. We're not doing any updating yet. We're just double checking that it doesn't already exist. Any guesses on which method we should use, which mongoose method we should use? If, we're, if we want to look for find, yeah, that would work. What do we, can we, can we get more specific? We're essentially just looking for a single match, right? Find one, yeah. And uh, Dejinx, you are absolutely right. We could probably do a find and add also. Um, no, that's all right. But we're just gonna do find one for this for 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 this time. Uh, but yeah, there's there's more complex um, methods out there too. Absolutely, like that can do multiple things in sequence. Um, for uh, for this one, we're just gonna use find one. Find one. But you can see if I is while I was typing there, find. One, yeah, so we can do, let's see. I don't see a find one and add, but there is a find one and update, find one and replace, find one and delete, find one and remove, right? There's so many options, which I think is really cool. That's why I like Mongoose, because you can do just about anything. The power of TypeScript compels you. <laughs> All right, so we pass in our query value and then we take that data that we get back and we pass it in again. Again, this is another questionable use of async await, but we're gonna fix it in the refactor. Yeesh. <laughs> but hey, in the end it works and that's all that matters, right? It can always be improved later on. All right. <laughs> and this really should, I don't think this, this shouldn't be called user data. Let's call it something different. We're going to call this menu data there. All right. So menu data, we grab the menu data. And if there is no match, right? If we hit the database and there is no match, then it's okay for us to add a new record, right? Because if there is a match, that means that one already exists and so we shouldn't add it. But if there is no match, then we're gonna go ahead and add it. So in this case, what we're gonna do is we're just gonna say let new menu equals new schemas.menu and we can just set some of the similar values, name, menu name, icon, and menu URL. I'm just gonna, I just grabbed those from up here and I'm just gonna paste them down here and fix my tabs. Oh, come on, there. So we create the new item. If there was no match, we can create this new item in the database. And then the, the last thing that we need to do is save it, right? So we create it and then we just say, hey, all right, I wanna save this. Okay, and finally, after we do that, we want to go ahead and redirect back home to show the new data that we just added. Whew. Okay, so new menu item, make sure the user is logged in. We grab the data that they entered in the form. We grab it and we drop it into some variables. We check the database to make sure that something with that same name doesn't already exist. And then if it doesn't, we go ahead and create our new menu item and we save it. So there we go. Okay, now I think at long last, 
five hours and 10 minutes into the stream, I think we might be done. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> the last thing that we are missing, the last thing that we are missing, and the thing that I never think about is styling. Now, we're not going to type all these out by hand. I don't got time for CSS. So <laughs> what we're going to do is we'll just go ahead and grab the style sheet from the repo um, and just kind of drop that in. But yes, so we still need to add in our style sheets. Uh, no, uh, new to this whole Node.js backend thing, does this code show up in the sources tab of the browser? Well, I mean, you can see, um, so if we look in browser, this is the app, by the way. Um, if we inspect, so, I mean, you can, we can see various things like the CSS and the HTML, if that's what you're looking for. We can also see any errors in the console. Um, and we can sort of like see the, we can see the uh, static files, right? Images, style sheets, et cetera. So we can see some things. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, I, I wasn't quite sure what code you were referencing there. We can see some things in the browser. No, um, like piece of sheet says, so I see what you're asking for. Um, no, so so the, the controller is on the back end, it's server side, it's not client side. So we can see client side things here in the console because they're facing the client, right? Um, but we can't see server side stuff, yeah. Cause it's on the server. <laughs> sure. Yeah. If there, and I mean, um, yeah, I mean, you, you can see a lot of things and you can kind of get a feel for how the app works, right. With, by looking at what you can see in the browser, but not the whole picture. So yeah. All right. Let's add our style sheet and we have our logo that we want to drop in as well. Um, so what I'm going to do for that is I'm just going to go back to the repo into the public folder. And by the way, um, just gonna, I haven't linked the repo in a while. So if you wanna see the finished code, I did already do it. This is my second time around. <laughs> I did already do it. Um, I'm gonna keep, I'm gonna be like improving this because I really do like this app. It's really fun. Uh, and there's a, but there's a lot of things that need to be better. Um, so I'm gonna be improving it, um, but feel free to take a look at it in its current form. Um, and yeah, for now, we're just gonna go ahead and grab the, um, CSS from the style sheets, because I ain't typing all this out. I'm gonna grab all this, drop it in, grab the logo. Oops, I shouldn't have done that. All right, there we go. How long is this? That's yeah, pretty long, okay. Grab that. Oops. Too many windows open. And what, what do I need to call this? Style sheets is gonna be called style.css. Plonk that in, save it. And then we're just gonna, last thing we're gonna add is our logo image. Now you could also replace this logo with like a font awesome icon too. That would work fine. You don't have to have this image folder. Um, yeah. That's all I've got in there. Okay, I'm just gonna drag this over from my finished code, actually. Copy, paste, there we go. All right, style sheets, menu hub, okay. I think we're ready to test. <laughs> Tay Mr. says, run a prediction on whether it'll work on the first try. Oh man. I do not have um I, I do not have uh, a high probability for that. But first try. I feel like y'all are jinxing it now. Uh yeah, I don't have a high probability of that happening. Um but we might get some fun. We might we might get to have fun with using Morgan and like troubleshooting too. That could be entertaining. So Let's see what we get. All right, did I save everything? I'm just gonna like check. Yeah, I think we're good. All right, NPM start, baby. Oh, come on. Can you let me type? Hmm. That's 
That's weird. Let's try again. Okay, we got an error. <laughs> I was expecting that. Not too bad, though. Okay, so the problem is in server.js. I think we were ready to test, says Mayan Wolf, as she finishes the whole project. Yeah, right? Five hours later. <laughs> what kind of web server are you using? Uh, I'm just using localhost. You could host, we could host this somewhere like, I don't know, Heroku before it stops being free. Um, but this is just locally hosted right now. Wrong connect Mongo version thingy? Maybe. Um, yeah, that's, I bet you're right. I bet it's the Mongo connect. Um, yeah. One dev says my anger issues could never. <laughs> oh, troubleshooting is an exercise in managing frustration. Okay, so let me just look here. Um, yeah, because it was that session thing. You're right. Yeah, so let's look in server.js and let's find that. So it says it's on line 44. Wait, or wait, line six? I don't know. We'll find it. It's right here. Anyway. Um, wait, no, 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 it's not. Right here. Yes, this. Yep, it's this. We just need to take off this session keyword here. Beep. Okay, let's try that. Okay. Troubleshooting is just a cool scavenger hunt. Yeah, it is. All right, so we got a new error this time. Uh, you must provide either Mongo URL, client promise, client in options. Okay. Cannot init client. Please provide correct options. Hmm. Mongo URL. Properties to Mongo. Oh, Mongo store properties. Okay. Oh, is it? Uh, I don't know what these should be. Oh, thank you, piece of shoot. Store, Mongo store create. Okay. All right. I'll take your word for it, piece of shoot. Yeah. It's amazing how quickly things change, right? You know, you have a, something for a couple months and they just completely decide to change it. Uh, I need to change this though, that's wrong. So in my .env, I need to change it to db string. Pew. Grab that, fix that. Okay. All right. And if you clone this down, like if you fork this from my repo and then cloned it down, you wouldn't have this problem because you would be using an older version of um, Mongo Connect. So you'd be okay. But just the reason I'm having this problem now is because when I, I built this from scratch, essentially, like, you know, installed everything from scratch. And so it's installing all the newest versions of everything. So, <laughs> all right, let's try it again. All right, what do we got now? Oh, <laughs> it's running, baby. <laughs> we are up and running. Homeless says, how can somebody with an IQ of 100 learn coding? Well, it's not so much about smartness. It's about, it's mostly just about persistence and good habits, right? If you have good habits and you're reviewing the material and making a habit of learning regularly, then you can learn. Anybody can. Yeah, it's patience and persistence. Those things are far more, as somebody who struggled a heck of a lot, like in college, because I didn't have good patience and study habits, like it doesn't matter how good you are in school or whatever, like when you're younger, as soon as you, you, you have to have those habits for the long term. All right, let's try it. So what port do I have? I think it's 8,500. Yeah, 8,500. Let's see what, let's see what happens. Whoa. Local hosts. 8,500. Oh, okay. So we got something rendering. We got something rendering. We have a menu button. We have a login button. 
it's 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 all coming up millhouse so far okay log in now i'm going to create a new account because i'm hitting a new database with this version i'm hitting a new database and so i'm going to need to create a new account um, all right i'm just going to say wolf at wolf.com you can tell how long how often i've been testing because Google wants to autofill the whole thing. All right, let's create an account. Let's see what we get. Okay, it says, please log in with your new account. And that's correct. Just the way this works, it wants you to log in. You know, once you create an account, it wants you to log in. So wolf at wolf.com. All right, log in. Woo, we are logged in, my friends. So authentication is working. That's good. Well, at least at least sign up is working. So sign up is working. Now let's check the database and make sure that things look okay in there. So I'm going to refresh this. See what we have. All right. So my new database is called Menu Tracker Three, which is right here. Let's see the menu. Yeah, <laughs> Menu Tracker Three, and that's great. Look, I have um, menu. This should be empty. That's correct. Don't have any menus yet. We should have a session. That's correct. And we should have a user. And look, see, okay, I don't know if you can see that, but the password is salted and hashed, just like we wanted, right? No plain text in the database for passwords. Um, the email is there, object ID and entry date. All golden so far. Hashed indeed. Mm, you, this, is, this is making me want like hash browns, like salted hash browns. I'm so hungry. <laughs> password hunter, password is hunter two. Yeah. Password one, hunter two. Okay. Now let's see if we can add a menu item, right? Let's add a menu. Uh, we're going to add a new menu and I'm just going to add gray house. Um, and this is probably going to be the wrong icon. I don't know which one is which. We're going to add Starbucks, even though that's wrong. Um, and then Starbucks. So we'll just add, we'll just do Starbucks because I'm basic. <laughs> All right. Bob at bobs.com. Yeah. So let's see if we can add a new item here. Hey, check it. So we have our logo here. Option we can edit or delete. Um, we can also just click this to view the menu on the restaurant's website. Um, let's see if, let's see what happens if we edit. <laughs> Hash browns for dinner. Anything sounds good to, for dinner right now for me. Oh, I made some really good soup. I made like a Mexican soup with like um, all sorts of like, you know, beans and rice and vegetables and all that. But a friend of mine gave me five ghost peppers you know, like the, the ghost, true ghost peppers. He grew them himself, gave them to me. I took two of them and they're like this big. I don't know if you've ever seen a ghost pepper, but they're like this big. And I chopped them up real fine and I mixed them into this massive like pan, like pail of soup. It's like, you know, my biggest pot um, on the stove. I made, you know, I've made enough soup for like two weeks and I, I, these tiny peppers, I chopped them up and I put them in there and I let it simmer for a long time, you know, those two peppers made that entire pot of soup so hot. It was friggin' wild. It's amazing how hot they are. It's super good though. It's delicious. Because the problem that I have when I make this soup a lot is, is when I mix in tomatoes, the like the acidity uh, or whatever of the tomatoes like dissolves the capsaicin. I don't know. There's some kind of reaction where like the tomatoes cancel out the capsaicin and any spicy things that I try to add. And so these ghost peppers survive, man. <laughs> it's good yeah i love it's it's delicious i love it um so i have three more i have three more peppers i got to figure out something to do with but anywho i just wanted to add that little anecdote <laughs> it's so good all right yeah we'll try the search and we'll try we're going to try edit delete we're going to try all these operations just to make sure everything's working so let's try to edit whoa okay <laughs> item is not defined okay i'm glad we're i'm glad we're checking so when we go to edit, item is not defined. Huh. 
Oh, I see. Okay, it doesn't like this. Yeah. That's a, this is the nice thing though, but look at this logging. Like, isn't it nice? It told it tells you exactly where the problem is. Yeah, I don't think I, I yeah, you're right. Um, piece of shoot. I think I'm not, yeah, I'm not passing the the data that this view is expecting. I'm not passing it to the view. It doesn't have it. So okay. Well, this in this in this case, Rascal, this is actually not a loop. This is just one one item being returned. So um, let's check it. All right, it's in the view. So what's being passed to the menu. Um, so we'll figure it out. All right, so in my menu controller, this is when we do the edit. So it's right, should be right here. It's not able to render that properly. So let's see. I'm going to check it against the repo code here. Nope, oh, not that. This. No worries, Rascal. Yeah, most of these are loops. This one just isn't. Um, okay, menu. Edit menu. Okay. So the problem is probably somewhere here. Wait, menu, find, query, take the item data. Okay. Title that we're going to be sending. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You're exactly right, piece of shoot. I did not pass in any item data. Yep. I grabbed it, but I didn't pass it in. So that's the problem. No biggie. Just forgot. Forgot something I was passing through, right? Easy fix. Okay, let's try again. Save that. Okay. Just gonna kill this and try again. All right. And you see, since I have a session, right? Since I logged in and I created a session, it kept me logged in. It didn't kick me out. It didn't kick me out. And so I don't have to log in again. We'll just try editing. Hey, there we go. Now that I clicked edit, it's populated everything with the item data that I passed through correctly this time. And I'm just going to change the name. Okay, I guess that doesn't matter because I'm not showing the name. So let's, uh, let's do this. Let's do, uh, let's just uh, change the icon. I like that it shows a little icon here as well. I think that's pretty cool. Um, We'll change it to something else. We'll change it to the Taco Rico logo just because I want to save. There we go. <laughs> now it's completely wrong. <laughs> All right, perfect. So that worked. So let's, um, we already checked that the view menu works. Um, now we can go ahead and delete. Let's go ahead and try deleting this item since it's wrong anyway. So we'll, let's delete it. And it pops up a little, are you sure box, which I appreciate. Are you sure you want to delete this? Yes, I am. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> okay. Got another problem on the, on, the, on the delete. That's fine. We'll fix that. Let's see what error we got. Going on an error hunt. ID is not defined, okay. And it's in controllers, menu, all right, 28. Thirty-seven, twenty-eight. okay. ID is not defined, okay, so it doesn't like this.
Oh, duh. Yeah, okay. This needs to be menu ID. Boop. <laughs> yep, exactly. <laughs> Ayu Vasquez coming in with the right answer on the first try. Good catch there. Welcome to the stream. Way to come in with an A+. Plus. <laughs> yep. Menu ID. Save that. Now it'll work. Just those little things. Okay. Try again. Oh, I didn't restart my server. Whoopsie. I need to have, why don't I have Nodemon running? I should have Nodemon running. Oh, well. While we're getting this many errors, I don't know. Okay, there we go. We're back up and running. Let's delete it. Hey. Okay. Let's add a couple more. Uh, Gray House. Uh, I don't know what any of these are. We're just going to guess. Okay. Uh, this one's, that's the menu for that. Hey, I got it right. Okay. Uh, let's add, a, let's add a couple so we can do a search. So Starbucks, Starbucks, Starbucks. And let's add one more. Uh, we'll do Vienna. And this one, Vienna, okay. And uh, one more. My favorite Korean restaurant. There we go, okay. <laughs> finger snaps and finger gun pointing commencing, you know it. <laughs> All right. So let's try a search. So let's say that I want to search for kimchi. And when I do that, it hits the database. It finds the matches. In this case, there's only one and it returns them. So, and it re-renders the page with just the match. Um, let's see, I don't have the taco Rico in there. So let's do... I'm just gonna do star. Let's try star and see what we get. Yeah, so when I do that, then I get Starbucks. And again, I can click and I can see the menu. Perfect. And now when I log out, I shouldn't be able to see anything. There we go. So I log out and everything is hidden. Um, and I can log in. Actually, let's try an invalid login. This 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 login is not valid. Let's try that. Yeah, okay. So when I do that, then the error is shown to me. It says it needs to be an email address. No worries, Caitlin. We're wrapping up anyway. We're just finishing our testing. First try, Scani. <laughs> That's generous. <laughs> All right. So perfect. When it, If I included an invalid email address, it told me so. So let's try a valid email address, but this user does not exist in the database, right? We have no user called wolf4. Let's try that. All right, when I do that, it says invalid login, which is exactly what we want. Um, and I think it would do the same thing if I had an invalid password as well. So it's just grabbing the error that we get on the server side and it's passing it back to the client and it's rendering it here. All right, so wolf at wolf.com. Password, log in, hey, there we go. And we're back. Awesome. So this is working, which is great. Um, there's a lot of things that I wanna make better about this, um, both front end and back end, right? So I wanna add more features as far as like adding some notes about each restaurant, you know, um, at maybe making the buttons bigger so that they're easier to click on mobile. Um, and then on the back end, obviously I wanna streamline some of those methods that are in the controllers, right? Um, making those less spaghetti, um, but that shouldn't be too hard. It's just refactoring. And I already did a first round of refactoring um, off of the tutorial code, um, sort of putting it in a true MVC structure. Um, Oh yeah, we can try creating another user with an email that already exists. Absolutely. Hey, Silent Spy, welcome. We're actually just finished our app and we're just doing some testing on it now. So yeah, let's try that. Let's do, oh, wait, sorry, create, there we go. Okay, 
will do that. And so I'm going to try to create a new account with this user that already exists. So create. Ooh, it's, did it let me do that? Let's see. Let's see what it did. It shouldn't have let me do that. Uh, let's refresh and see what it did. Oh, I guess maybe it just treated it like a login. Hmm. That's odd. Might have to investigate that a little bit. Because, yeah, it didn't create a new user. All right, I'm going to try to create a new user with a different username just to make sure that that's working properly. So at least it didn't create a new user. Oh, I didn't do it. Yeah, I didn't do a different password, right? I just let it autofill. So let's try that. Well, okay. And we'll try new password. Hmm, okay. Let's try, let's see if that did it. No, it didn't. Hmm. So that's not behaving exactly the way that I would want. Um, it's acting like it created a new user, but it didn't. Um, so I'll have to just change that behavior. Just make sure it's throwing the right error instead of that. Well, what, what I'm going to try to do now is I'm going to try to log in with that new password, right? So See if it gives me an invalid password or not. Yeah. Okay. So the hash was the same. It did, at least it didn't overwrite the password. So it's behaving. It's doing the right thing. It's not writing an identical user, but the behavior within the controller is not what we want. So I'll have to change that. Um, Cause yeah, we don't, we want it to inform the user if they try to create a duplicate. Cause I know we checked for that, but I don't think that the, um, notification is good. I'm going to be re rewriting that entire um, method anyway, because I don't like how convoluted it is. So that'll be something I'll have to put in for the rewrite. Just thinking about those test cases. Absolutely. Um, but I, I won't do that right now. But that is, I'm glad you had me check that because that's important. Okay. Log back in, perfect. I think we tested all these things. We tested search. Trying a random menu, perfect. We did the edit, we did the delete. Yeah. I think crud-wise, it's working well. I think we just need to, you know, there's things that need to be refined and, and user experience needs to be improved. Rascal says, yeah, there's a branch for if there's not an existing user, but otherwise the output is the same. Exactly. Yeah, that's kind of what I was remembering. Either way, it just renders the login page. So that's not what we want. So I'll just add some additional conditions in there to handle that. Yeah. Perfect. And that's the, like I said earlier, I mean, um, I feel like that's the best way to do tutorials, right? You do a, you, you do a tutorial and then you modify the crud out of it to be exactly what you want. So, and again, I do want to thank the person that was the inspiration for this app, which is, who is a YouTuber. Um, I, like I said, I've, I took their stuff, you know, and have heavily modified it, but that doesn't take away that they thought of this idea first, um, for this type of an app. Um, and so they do deserve some credit. And so once again, um, here's the link to the first part of that tutorial. Um, and, you know, maybe give them a follow. So that's them. And they just thought of a cool idea and I took it and ran with it, but. <laughs> All right, well, I think we're done here, folks. Um, I'm excited to keep iterating on this app and improving it um, and, you know, adding features and functionality. Because like I say, I think this is something, this is literally an app I will like, use in my daily life. Um, once I make it a little bit better, um, I'm going to have this bad boy like on my phone and be using it. Oh, yes. And the dolly link. Yes, of course. Let me I'm just going to pull a new window here and just find that for you. Dolly. Dee, 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 dee.
yeah okay so um if you just go to here's the here's the link for you dan um this is the website you should be able to sign up there um to be on the waiting list oh thank you serata <laughs> Um, if you do want to see Dolly, what it, what it looks like, um, this is Dolly. Um, and you can literally put in a prompt for something, um, and just, and you get back, you know, some pretty wild stuff. So yeah, it's neat. Um, I think I've used up all my credits, but, uh, I have to wait for them to come back, but here's an otter with a pearl earring, which I think is pretty great. Um, I might have some credits. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, homeless, are you asking who built Dolly? Let me see. I think there's a, how do I get to the, they have a homepage or like a blog or whatever. Uh... Yeah. So if you want to read more about them, um, you can go to this site. about here we go yeah it's by open ai okay yeah they're a private company and they want to make super crazy smart ai stuff which i'm actually i don't know i'm kind of into that i like i think it's really cool what it can do um yeah russell says those 15 free monthly credits don't feel like enough yeah <laughs> i think i blew through mine super quick i think i have 15 credits now but uh for this month but i'm gonna i'm gonna hoard them a little bit probably and so i have you know, can build them up a little. Cause yeah, after that you have to pay, um, to get more credits. So you want to learn AI? Yeah. I mean, it's going to, it's the new frontier, right? AI for president might be someday. Um, I might actually have the, the opportunity at work to learn a little bit of automation, um, as far as like, um, AI automation. So talking about like, um, programming chatbots and stuff. So that might be kind of fun. I don't know if I'm, I'm hoping I get the opportunity to participate in that project, it's up in the air whether I get the chance to or not, but um, it might be fun. Yeah, training models. Yeah, and you can, they have an API. So um, OpenAI has an API. Um, they can do more. They're more than just Dolly, right? They can do natural language generation. Um, they can even write code. Um, and so they have a ton of, you know, they have Codex, which can translate natural language to code. I haven't tried it. But that seems that's wild to me. You know, you type a sentence saying what you want, and then it will it'll write it out as code. So sort of like GitHub Copilot, but I think much smarter. Um, and so yeah, they have several different APIs um, that you can choose from. I would highly this this their website is kind of fascinating. I would highly suggest taking a look at it and seeing if you might be able to incorporate one of their APIs into one of your projects. New AI overlord brought to you by MindWolf. I mean, honestly, <laughs> I think it's going to happen. We might as well. That's kind of why I want to get involved with that a little bit, because I feel like no matter how angry we are about or might be about artificial intelligence, it's happening anyway. So we might as well be involved and be good stewards and steer it in the right direction, right? Rather than just fighting against it, we should be good stewards and make sure things are going in the right direction. Just my thoughts. Hey, Z Films. <laughs> if you can't beat him, join him. Exactly. And I don't think we can beat him. So we're going to have to join him in one way or the other. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I want to steal things from other websites and use it in my own website. I heard that good artists copy and better artists steal. I mean, a lot of coding is copying and pasting in some, in some capacity. I feel like there's so many free code bases out there that people just put out there for free, like all of my stuff. Like, I don't care if y'all use my stuff, um, as long as you build something that is yours, right? You could use my stuff as a template and then build your own app off of that. Build, make it unique to you, add things, remove things, break things, but you're welcome to use my stuff as a template. Um, I prefer it if you tag me on Twitter so I can see what you make. Uh, I always like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's a big part of coding is using stuff that already exists, right? But the line gets crossed when you literally steal something from somebody else, like word for word or line for line completely, and then try to pass it off as your own, right? 
Yeah, you got and you got to be careful about images. If you're looking for free places to get images, um, my favorite so far is unsplash.com. They have tons of high resolution images on every topic you can think of. Unsplash.com is really great. Um, I use them for a lot of things. C film says I've been studying SQL lately and adding it more to my website. That's awesome. Yeah. SQL's a good thing to know. It's just so common, right? It's every it's literally everywhere. So why not know a little bit of it? Once I get dev money, I'm gonna have cyborg arms and legs installed. <laughs> Dream big, my friend. How should we properly give credits for free images? Well, sometimes the site that you get it from might give you instructions on how to credit it, like exactly how to have a tagline, you know, crediting that 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 image. I don't know. I um, You could always credit the photographer too. Like on Unsplash, they always tell you who the photographer was. So you could always just credit them too. C Film says, I had a professor in college who said, copy, paste, tweak. Yep, those are the three steps. Copy, paste, and tweak so you understand exactly. Speaking of which, I do, so I do want to share one more link to the repo that we were using today. Um, if you want to use this, you can. Like I say, it will be made better, but you're welcome to use it to your own ends. Um, I would appreciate if, you know, you do credit maybe the original creator, Koda Kai, um, and then, you know, credit me too, if you want. Um, but yeah, so use that. Um, use Leon's templates too. So again, I'm sure you all have this already, but this is Leon's basic template for a, an MVC um, app with off. Um, so use that as well. Build cool stuff. You know, be amazing. Uh, Kayla Bree says, the book Murderbot is so good and cool, kind of related more and more to more and more robotic people walking around. Yeah, so I actually love the Murderbot series. They, it's very clever. It's very funny. I like it for a lot of reasons. Um, yeah, I think I've read most of them. I don't know if I've caught the most recent couple. But yeah, I've, I've read most of the Murderbot series. Really insightful and fun stories. Absolutely. Murderbot is so good. Yeah. <laughs> it really is. And they're novellas, so they're not super long. Exactly. So you can kind of just like, you know, they're digestible. And and Murderbot is just great. Like the character Murderbot is so great. Uh, MME says, should we credit people in the README or actually on a page of the app like the footer? I mean, I would probably credit them in the app itself, like at the bottom of the page or maybe like text at the bottom of the image or below the image. Um, if I, if I needed to credit someone, that's probably how I would do it just so that the people visiting the site can see. And you could also put it in the README too, but I mean, if you really actually want the people visiting the site to see that credit, then you might want to put it on the, on the page itself, you know? Yeah, and if you are, so if you're using non-open, um, like um, like non-free uh, free use images, um, free for use images, like from Unsplash or something like that, if you're using if you're using anything else on a paid site, yeah, you're gonna want to be sure that you you have the license to do so. So um, what's the what's the term um, license? Uh, what's that that open license? I can't think of it. I mean, if you're using stuff from like Unsplash, which is truly like royalty free images, um, then you're probably fine and you don't have to talk to a lawyer. But MIT, um, the one for images though, where like when you do a Google image search and you can like check that, I can't think of it. Uh, let's just search for like kitten. So if I do this, is it tools, usage rights, creative commons. That's it. <laughs> Couldn't think of it. Creative commons. Yeah. So creative commons can often allow you to use those types of things for your own purposes. Um, 
Yeah, Creative Commons, but you do need to, you know, you should read the license. Usually the Creative Commons has some terms in the license. And so you just read that, make sure that it's okay for you to use with or without attribution. Sometimes they might, sometimes it might say that you have to add like an attribution to the, to the creator and say like, this was photographed by Joe Schmo. Um, and sometimes they're like, no, whatever, just do whatever you want. Um, so it just depends. Just read the license and you should be okay. Yeah. Alrighty. Anything, any other, any other last questions? If not, I think we'll go ahead and do a raid and we'll wrap it up for tonight. Cause I need to get ready for house of the dragon, which is going to be coming on very soon in my time zone. So very important. Do I have a personal website? I do. Um, it's not up right now. Um, I am working on it, making it better. So I'll have it back up soon and I'll probably add the links on my Twitter profile and stuff like that. Um, but no, I'm, I'm currently working on improving it. Um, so it's down. Yeah, it's been good so far. I'm excited to see where it goes. All right. Uh, Trinae says, how do we set the entry date to a specific time zone? Um, it's a good question. I imagine you could do a conversion, but you would probably do that. Um, there's probably a way to do it in the schema itself. Um, I don't know what that would be though. You might have to Google that one. <laughs> um, there's probably, but there is probably a way to do that in the schema itself. Because, yeah, I think by default, it probably sets it to, like, GMT or UTC. Oh, we got some several choices, several possible choices for a raid today. Um, anybody have any preferences? Anybody have any preferences on who we should raid tonight? Anybody they would like me to raid? Chris says, Lego stream win. I'm hoping soon because I really want to build that set. Z underscore. What do they do? What does Z underscore do? Yeah, we got Freckled Science. They're always lots of fun. I think we raided them a couple weeks ago. Kars is, uh, what is, uh, what is the underscore, uh, what's their stream topic? Coding with strangers. Oh, okay. Let's see what they're doing. Oh, they look like they're doing some dev work. Yeah. Okay. Let's, let's read uh, coding with strangers. They look like they're doing some coding. Um, yeah, never rated them before, but let's, uh, let's give it a shot. So, uh, they're working on something or other. <laughs> let's see what they're working on. Okay. All right. I'm starting the raid now. Oops. I think I hit the wrong button. Sorry. Let me try again. <laughs> Okay, let's try that again. <laughs> all right, here we go, rating now. I will see you all again on Wednesday. Looking forward to it. See you soon. Have a great Monday. <laughs>